Yeah. I'm self-conscious. Yeah, I will. I will retweet you. I see it. I'm on our account, though, so, you know. But I do hear it. I do hear us talking through it. So that's, yeah, yeah. Well, I just switched it to both of us. Well, me and the beautiful still image of you. Um, so, yeah, will you test it for me and then we can. <clears throat> hey, everyone. Um, please, will you let us know how we sound? Sorry, my dogs are deciding to come in. You can't hear yourself. Okay, that's interesting. Hmm. Yeah. How about, hear... how about now? Okay. Oh, I, I, figure, I figured out what happened. Okay, okay. no, I, fig I figured out what happened. This it should be... is my voice. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah. I can hear it now. <laughs> okay, good. How are we level wise? Uh I, I think it sounds pretty balanced to me. We can uh ask ask our audience what they think. Which I can't actually see. But... Yeah. Oh yeah, you can't see the chat. I'm gonna have to do all that. Yeah, that's a shame. Yeah. Yeah, so if you guys um we're gonna get started here in a sec, but if you haven't noticed yet, there is a uh, a, a picture of Matt and not yep. his face. Um, because, uh, if you've been listening to, we've got warm, you might've noticed that Matt's, uh, sound quality has been lower than it normally is for the past couple weeks because he's having issues. Matt, you want to explain your issues? I don't, I don't, I think you could explain them better than me. I mean, Besides, I mean, the yeah. basis is that ISPs are terrible. Yeah. I just moved into a new house and it have been without internet for like three weeks and they're they're like oh yeah uh we will have the proper you know cables installed in your area sometime in december maybe <laughs> and uh yeah. 
so so we've we've had to basically make do here um with recording through skype on his phone so that's where all the podcasts that have had matt on them for the past couple weeks have been um and that's what this is going through as well so we made do with a a nice picture of matt and they'll just have to look at me throughout this i'm yeah i'm sorry um, yeah. but it's gonna be good um i think that the sound quality is good enough it's not it's not what we would like but technology is good But that uh, that net neutrality though, that's gonna really really help with your situation, right? Oh yeah, right. I'll I'll make sure that I get the the deluxe podcaster package when I. Uh... <laughs> oh my god. All right, so I think I think we're about ready to get going here. Yep. Just making sure I have everything set. Cool. Um. Yeah. Matt already has the deluxe package. They say, Matt, they're <laughs> saying you've you've taken your poker face to a whole new level, um, which is just very impressive. Yeah, just uh, I'm actually that's actually a video feed of me, and I'm I'm actually speaking. You just can't see my face move. I guys, I really wanted to like do something to make it so Matt's mouth would move a little. Like I could just insert like a little animation of a moving mouth. Um, that was way more effort than it was worth, so I didn't do it. But um, I just shrugged, Matt. I forget, Matt can't see me, so <laughs> <laughs> this is gonna take some getting used uh, to. What's the point of it all? I know. I can't see you. I know. All right. Well, let's go ahead and get started then. Um, we've got some people in here now. And okay. Some more we'll we'll filter in as we go. Okay. Because I am very excited to talk about this book. Yeah, me too. And I'm recording. Guys, Matt has this like phobia that I always forget to press the record button, <laughs> which is weird because that's never happened once. Has it's it? True. Has it, it ever happened? It's never. No, you've never forgotten, but I I have forgot to click the record button <laughs> on my end, and usually it never matters because it's just backup. But I'm always like, oh my god, thank, thank God I'm not responsible for this. <laughs> uh, Vahel wants to know if. Uh, I it sa or says I can send send you selfies during the talk, which would which would be <laughs> weird. I don't know. Yes. Uh, um, Kevin wants to know if you print out the slides, Matt. Did you print out the slides? Cause uh, I, uh, I went ahead and loaded them preemptively so that I could yeah. use them on my computer separately. Oh, so you didn't see that last minute change? No, no. I'm just kidding. There okay. was there was okay. Let's go ahead. Let's go ahead and just do this because we'll be here all night. Because yep. I think we have a lot to say about this book. Okay. And we normally go way over on these things anyway. Yeah. All right. So we're going to... Uh, should I do... I don't know what to do on these live casts. Do I count us down? What's what's the proper... <laughs> I think you can... I think counting us down is fine. All right. I think I'm anybody's going to... Yeah. All right, everyone. I'm going to count us down. Um, let's go in five, four, three, two... Hello and welcome to the Daily Planet Book Club, our mo monthly live stream discussion of a book chosen by you, our listeners. My name is Scott Daly, your host, and I'm joined as always by my best friend in the whole world, Matt Freeman. That's right, Scott. We're coming to you live from our magical midnight grove where we hang out and get special powers that actually don't matter all that much. How mysterious. Matt, why don't you tell the good people of the internet what book we are talking about today? Well, you guys finally made Scott's dreams come true and selected the book he wanted, The Secret Place by Tana French. So, Scott, why don't you do the honors and tell us what this book is about? All right. The Secret Place is a murder mystery novel by Tana French. It's, it's technically number five in the Dublin Murder Squad series, which all center around the Dublin Police's murder division, um, which I guess, like, I didn't know. I guess that's an Irish thing. They call it the Murder Squad. I don't know. Um, uh, they, they solve... Um, guys, they solve, they solve murders. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, we are joined today. We've got a few people in chat. We've got Tringard. We've got Vahale. We've got Kevin. Um, if there's anyone else in there, go ahead and say hello. We'll be watching and, and, and reading your questions and your comments as we go through this live stream discussion of the book. Um, we're very excited. Uh, so I guess, Matt, should I read, should I read the back cover of this thing? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a good way All to right. start out. All right. 
Detective Stephen Moran has been waiting for his chance to join Dublin's murder squad when a 16-year-old Holly Mackey arrives at his office with a photo of a popular boy whose body was found at a girl's boarding school earlier, a year earlier. Well, I can't read. A photo had been posted at The Secret Place, the school's anonymous gossip board, and the caption says, I know who killed him. Stephen joins with Detective Antoinette Conway to reopen the case, beneath the watchful eyes of Holly's father, fellow detective Frank Mackey, with the clues leading back to Holly's close-knit group of friends, to their rival clique, and to the tangle of relationships that bound them to all the bound them all to the murdered boy, the privileged underworld of teenage girls turns out to be more mysterious and more dangerous than the detectives imagined. Well, Matt, that's all uh that's all true. That's all true. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um it's a little a little more complicated than that, though. Uh, like, like we'll get into it here in a minute. The, this this book is is more than just about this crime. It, this book is about friendship and youth and and the power of that friendship and and unsurprisingly, secrets. It's a, it's about secrets, Matt. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it's it's really it's really delightful how um, how fun it's going to be to trace all these themes through the work because uh, it's my favorite kind of thing where the themes really do resonate in multiple places at multiple levels. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it's, I think there's some people that listen to this podcast that possibly haven't read the book yet. This is, I guess because it's a murder mystery, this is one of those ones that I would really strongly recommend against that. Not that like the who done it is the most important part of the story. It's not, but I think the, the pull of trying to figure out who's responsible kind of pulls you through the book a little bit. So yeah, you mean recommend against, that. Yeah, you mean recommend against listening to this without reading the book? Yeah, right. Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I feel like that's that's pretty fair. Th- these Tana French books are really good. I mean, should should I talk about my history with Tana French? Is that, yeah, go ahead. Talk, talk yeah. about your history with Tana French, and then go into um, what you thought of this book as a whole. Yeah. I, so I, I had read I had read um, in the woods years and years ago, and it it was it was so like psychologically devastating to me for whatever reason. Um, I think I know what the reason was. I think it was essentially that like this book is sort of laser calibrated at the psychology of like a, uh, uh, you know, 16 year old girl. And I think, I think uh, uh, in the woods was laser calibrated at the psychology of a male of whatever age I was at the time. And it just sort of blew me apart mentally. Uh, And I was like, I was like, it wasn't that I didn't think it was good. It was that I was like, I don't really want to subject myself to this kind of experience. This is like too, <laughs> too intense of a, of a reading experience. It was I'd like no other book had ever really quite affected me like that. So I kind of actually hedged away from any, any more ton of French books, not because they were bad, but because I was like, I, I just kind of like to just go about my life and not have to have these little disruptions. But, um, <laughs> this, this book came up on the book club and I was like, all right, Matt, time to face your fears. And I'm really glad that I did honestly. Yeah. So, what was your, I guess, overall impression of the Secret Place? Oh, I really enjoyed it. I, I, uh, I was, I enjoyed the whole thing, uh, cover to cover, and and I thought about it quite a lot afterward. It was, it was really fun, and I really uh, would recommend it. Actually. Yeah, I'm the same way. Um, you had me a little worried uh, with your with your talks about in, in the woods. I think um, one of the critics that I, I really like. Um, uh, a woman by the name of Meredith Borders that used to run Birth Movies Death, she's stepped away from doing that now, wrote a whole article about Tana French and the Dublin Murder Squad series um, and basically recommended each and every one of the books. So I had these books on my list for a while now and had not gotten to them. Um, So when the opportunity to put them in the book club came up, I took it and I picked one that you hadn't read and it was the one that was like at the top of her list. Um, She made it really seem like these are not books that need to be read in the order they were published, which I think it, after reading this, I absolutely agree with. I think maybe maybe there was some stuff that I could have picked up on knowing who um, Frank Mackey is because he's one of the, the protagonists in one of the other books, but nothing that like damaged or ruined the story in any way. Yeah, I but, think that's generally how they're connected is there's generally like yeah. one detective who sort of spills over into the next story, but it's not, a, it's not an intricate web you know, of, yeah. of linear plotting. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I really love this book. I think it's one of the, I think this is my favorite book of the, the four that we've done on the book club so far. And probably one of the best books I've read all year. Um, I really found it, it very compelling. I found the, the murder mystery compelling. I found 
the the structure of the book worked into in its favor really well how Tana French doles out information to us by going back in time to the kids versus um, coming back to to the detectives actually uh, investigating the case and I think that that balance like worked really well for me I I really liked the themes of it I liked how it all kind of tied together in the end um, and I found all the characters super compelling so I was I was completely along for this and I cannot wait to read more Tana French books yeah awesome I all agree. Right, so, so do we just want to, I guess, do you guys listening, what were your overall thoughts as we move into uh, the, the first of our slides? I'm curious, what, what did you guys think overall? Did you, did you like it? Did you not? Um, and we'll, we'll get into maybe, maybe why or why not a little bit, a bit later. Um, but, but for now, while we're waiting for the, the stream to, to catch up because it's behind, um, let's, let's move into the first slide. You want to, you want to tackle this first one, Matt? This is the opening sure. lines of the book. Yeah. All right. Uh, and this is from the POV of, of Holly. Um, and it's kind of in the past, if you will. Um, there's this song that keeps coming on the radio, but Holly can only ever catch bits of it. Remember, oh, remember back when we were a, cl a girl's clear or er uh, voice clear and urgent, the fast light beat lifting you up off your toes and speeding your heart to keep up. And then it's gone. She keeps trying to ask the others, what is it? but she never catches enough to ask about. It's always slipping in through the cracks when they're in the middle of talking about something important or when they have to run for the bus. By the time things go quiet again, it's gone. There's just silence or Rihanna or Nicki Minaj pounding silence away. Right. Um, yeah, so this is kind of, um, this, this opening is a recurring beat that happens throughout the entirety of of the story that, that we have this song that Holly is trying to grasp onto. Um, and I, I just like, I, I wanted to open with this cause, cause we're going to, we're going to close with it. Um, but I really, I really like the idea. Like there's, there, neither of us are, are teenage girls. Um, but there's something kind of universal to a lot of the, the things that are discussed in this, this story. And one of them is this idea that you have this song that's on the tip of your tongue and you can't place it. And that kind of, that, that, that quintessential, like, childhood nature of, of having this song that you're searching for and how that kind of ties into this 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 part of your life that you're kind of chasing after but you can't quite get a hold of it and every time you try to pay attention to it 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 escapes from you and i really like the imagery of that yeah yeah and it does turn out that the song when she hears more of it is uh relevant to her situation in a, in a you know thematic way i guess yeah no absolutely uh, and we will we will get to that yeah this also it, th there's not a whole lot here and it's not it's not that long but it does kind of exemplify the prose style um where you know you've got you've got really kind of beautiful descriptive language like the, the fast light beat lifting you up off your toes and speeding your heart to keep up like that's she, you could have just said like it was a up-tempo song you know but like it, it, there's there's so much so much of this book is written so beautifully like that i think yeah yeah um, so to get back to the, every, what everyone thought, um, Trinkard said he, he liked it, but not as much as, as you and I did. The format kind of grew on him, but he, he didn't care for it early on, um, and it, it gave away too much of the mystery part. Um, uh, Vahale says there was nothing that they disliked. They were slightly put off by the weird magic that showed up, but didn't really do anything. Uh, we are absolutely going to talk about that a lot. Yeah. Um, Kevin says that Tana French is the most readable purple prose that he's ever read. And that's, <laughs> I like that. That I I, yeah. I I agree with that. Yeah. Um, yeah. It is it is very flowery and very descriptive, but not in a, a kind of difficult, way to read. Yeah, I mean, I think she's very precise with it. Like it's yeah, it's 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 purple in the sense that, she's she's using more words than she needs to, needs to. But, I feel like n n I guess need is the operative word there because she's she's painting a very very precise specific picture in, in almost all instances and the reason she uses those quote-unquote extra words is because she wants to nail down that exact thing she's trying to paint in your head that's how i feel anyway yeah no i completely agree with you and one of the things i think we're going to get into as we go is the um the difference in tone and the difference in the prose between what the detectives are doing it and what we're going back to the kids so i mean the the, the biggest most most obvious one is that um when we're with the detectives we're in first person we're in um wow i just forgot his name because he's 
the narrator Steven. in that. Yeah, Stephen. Thank you. Steve, um, we're in. Yeah, Stephen Moran. Yeah. Moran. There we go. We're in uh, Detective Moran's head the entire time. It's first person. When we go back to the girls, we're always in third person, um, and it. Uh, I, I like that a lot because we're like when when you're in third person when you're first of all you're in the past so you're like you're not really in it you're just kind of observing it so i like that we went third person with that but also like the whole thing with the girls is that they're this like they're this this tight-knit group that you can't really understand from the outside so Mm -hmm. putting us in that that further away perspective like emphasizes that a little bit um it, it reinforces that that feeling of you are not really in the middle of this you are just like being a voyeur on on their friendship. Oh yeah, I thought that I worked really well. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. Also, the story does need to jump between them and talk about you know what Holly knows versus what Selena knows and so forth. So it needs right. to skip in and out of different people's heads. So I don't think it would have worked at all to just be in one person's head. But yeah, I do like your point that it's like you're you 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 don't get to be one of them. That's uh yeah that's cool. Yeah yeah. Um, okay, so so we we've moved on to the next slide now, and this is this is the discovery of um, Holly coming to to Stephen Moran and showing him the note that was left on the secret place. Um, I guess I'll take this one, Matt. Okay. This was on the board. The folder said Holly Mackey, four L, social awareness studies, scribbled over. Inside, clear plastic envelope. Inside that, a thumbtack fallen down onto one corner, and a piece of card. I recognized the face faster than I've recognized Holly's. He had spent weeks on every front page and every TV screen, on every department bulletin. This was a different shot, caught turning over his shoulder against a blur of autumn yellow leaves, mouth open in a laugh, good-looking, glossy brown hair, blushed forward Borban style to thick, dark eyebrows that sloped down the outsides, gave him a puppy doll look, clear skin, rosy cheeks, a few freckles along the cheekbone, not a lot, a jaw that would have turned out strong if there'd been time. Wide grin that crinkled his eyes and nose. A little bit cocky, a little bit sweet. Young. Everything that rises is green in your mind when you hear the word young. Summer romance, baby brother's hero, cannon fodder. Glued below his face, across his blue t-shirt, words cut out of a book, spaced wide like a ransom note. Neat edges, snipped closed. I know who killed him. Okay, so I I pulled this out because I I wanted to pull... (laughs) these two slides out immediately because I think this, this very clearly demonstrates exactly what we've been talking about, which is this, this drastic difference between the style of prose for, for Detective Moran and for the girls. Um, I, think, I think purple prose is the perfect thing to describe um, how the girls is. And, and I think we'll see Detective Moran's style of prose move into that more as the book goes. But here at the very beginning... This is very short to the point. Like we have short sentences um, inside that clear plastic envelope inside that thumbtack. And like the way he describes Chris is just practical, clear skin, rosy cheek, freckles, a jaw that would have been strong. Like it's very descriptive. It's detective-y, right? I mean, it's like we were in this guy's head. So we think like he thinks. Yeah. That's one thing you notice is your, your, the, the, the thoughts of the text are, are Moran's thoughts and his impressions of things that becomes really strong in certain places, especially when they get to the school, um, you know, but like you get the sense that he's a bit of an, a romantic. Uh, and, and that's, I mean, I think that's very much supported elsewhere in the text actually, but like this idea that, yeah. you know, everything, everything that rises green in your mind when you hear the word young summer romance, baby brother's hero, cannon fodder, like th- th- these are, <laughs> these are his thoughts. Th- these are, you know, I, I do think you're supposed to think this is what this detective is, is thinking. And, and, he actually, you know, it, it kind of comes out later on that he has this streak of romanticism and uh, and his partner does not. And that, that's kind of where a lot of the, the more fun tension comes from, actually. Um, so yeah, he's complicated. I, I, I think he is. And I think the cool thing about this is he from a picture, he is painting a picture of, of who Chris, the, the victim, is. And he's kind of pretty correct. Right. I mean, like like a little bit cocky, a little bit sweet. These are like part of, part of Chris's character as we learn more about him is this kid who um, was kind of like, cert- like searching for his identity, searching for who he is. He's not a great person. He's done bad things, but he's done good things too. And he's trying to find out who he is. And it, it, it kind of amazed me how, how <laughs> Moran pegged him kind of from the beginning here 
just by looking at a picture. And, and that does a couple things that defines Chris for us a little bit, but that defines the detective too. Like the, 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 his ability to peg people. And you're right that that sentence, summer romance, baby brother's hero, cannon fodder, that is character defining that, that is shows who Moran is a detective. Like everything that rises green in your mind, when you hear the word young summer romance, baby brother's hero, cannon fodder that i mean that says something about him as a person yeah those are those are the things that rise green in stephen moran's mind <laughs> right, <laughs> and that's... right like the third thing in his mind is cannon fodder yeah. and that is that is it, i mean that's a character beat that is, that tells you something about the type of person moran is mm-hmm. that yeah he, he is this romantic like the thing, first thing he met lists is summer romance being baby brother's hero but then also yeah the, the idea that that we just throw young people out there to die for us yeah. Um, and it's, it, it's, it's interesting. It's interesting. Yeah. 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 The, the, it looks like in the chat, we're talking a little bit about the, the back and forth structure of the story, how we went back and forth, not only between points of view, but in time and, and different parts of the story. Um, Kevin says he, he loved and hated it, um, because the detective chapters were so engaging that every cutaway was painful. Um, and, and Hale says it was like exposition versus action. That's also true. Um, yeah, you know that there were. Uh, I, I think I, I think I feel that a little bit. But there were some bits where I was actually agonized to switch away from what was happening with the girls. Um, right. U- usually not the case, and that, I think that's just because you know when you're in the action part, which is the Stephen Moran part, then you're you're like, okay, what what happens next? And, and <laughs> but but sometimes what's going on with the girls is actually really really interesting. Yeah. No, I, I completely agree. Um, I, I like. I there's a lot of books that that do this point of view switching where it's always you're always kind of sort of frustrated when they usually end you on some like mini cliffhanger and then you have to switch chat switch point of view again so you're being taken away from the the action that was happening at present. No, Jar Martin. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he does that. You're right. He does that all the time. And Martin, the the thing that Martin does the most is you will never go back to that action. The next time you go back <laughs> to that character, that thing that you were <laughs> that you were. Uh, concerned about yeah Yeah. is has already happened it's over um but here like the thing that i liked so much about it here is it's like you can imagine french taking these two stories and then like finding almost the best way to layer them like there's information you learn in each that ties into the next and gives you a greater appreciation for something and it's used one way or the other like like you learn something in a detective story that doesn't make a lot of sense at the time, but then we cut back to the girls and something that we've learned in the future now makes sense in the past. And we do it vice versa. And it's it's like Tana French kind of layered these in, I think probably, I can't think of a better way to do it. That like information rev- is revealed perfectly, in my opinion. Like you learn stuff just when you need to and you, but you don't learn enough. I just, I, I thought it was great. Yeah, and there's just enough complexity and red herrings and and detours and and uh, you know d- dead ends that not only do you not know who the killer is until you're kind of supposed to, but yeah. um, you you actually have wrong guesses at some point. And but at, at no point does it feel like artificial herky jerk kind of manufactured confusion, which is something I've seen in some detective novels. Yeah, it never cheats. Um, yeah, the, the yeah. clues are all there. And as I was looking through it all um in preparation for this like i focus on a lot of the becca point of view chapters and you see you see where it's there um i i put when i i pulled one quote here um it's not it's not this one yet but but there, there's one where you see like in the background becca just doing things and like <laughs> it doesn't it doesn't jump out of you at the time but when you go back and read it you're like oh yeah that that was weird I yeah. think that we're going to get to it, but it's like she takes a twig off of Julia's head and then she puts it in her pocket to keep it. Yeah. And like at the time you're like, huh? But then <laughs> it's like, wait a minute, that's weird. Yeah. Um, yeah. But okay. Yeah. So this, subtle, yeah. yeah. So we got this next slide. Um, this is the first day of, of Holly uh, as a boarder at the school. Yeah. All right. And I'll, I'll read this one. Sure. Okay. They lie there, feeling their bodies sink deeper into the glade and change rhythm to blend with the things around them. The tink, tink, tink of a bird somewhere, the slow slide of a blink of sunbeams through the thick cypresses. Holly realizes she's flipping through the day, the way she does every afternoon on the bus home, picking out bits for telling, 
a funny story with a bit of boldness in it for dad, something to impress mum, or if Holly's pissed off with her, which it seems like she mostly is these days, something to shock her into letting her reaction slip out. Sweet Lord, why would anyone want to say such a... While Holly rolls her eyes to heaven, it hits her that there's no point in doing that now. The picture each day leaves be- the picture each day leaves behind isn't going to be given its shape by dad's grin and mom's lifting eyebrows, not anymore. Instead, it'll be shaped by the others. Holly looks at them and feels today shifting, fitting itself into the outlines she'll remember in 20 years' time, 50. The day Julia came up with the Daleks. The day Selena and Becca brought her and Julia into the Cypress Glade. We better go in soon, Becca says without moving. It's early, Julia says. You said we're allowed to do whatever we want. We can, mostly. When you're new, though, they get hyper about being able to see you all the time, like you might run away otherwise. They laugh softly in the circle of still air. That flash hits Holly again. Thread of wild goose calls strung high across the sky, her fingers woven deep into the cool pelt of grass, flutter of Selena's lashes against the sun. And this has been forever. Everything else is a daydream falling away across the horizon. This time it lasts. So this is a great example of that purple prose that Kevin was talking about. Um, and, and like I actually found when I was going through to pull quotes for this, I kept pulling mostly from the girls timeline mm-hmm. <laughs> because the, I just I love so much how it's written. And I just like, yeah, I have to put this in here because this is beautiful and, and thematic and, and wonderful. And then I had to go back later and, and stick some of the detective stuff in there because that's important, too. And I, I like I love that stuff as well. But I just found like when I'm looking for quotes, I just this stuff is like infinitely quotable. I love the imagery here. I love like the, the flashes that are hitting them and the, the, the realization that this is this is everything. This is everything to us. This, we're going to remember this forever. This is going to be part of us forever. We're going to live in this moment forever. And of course, we know that that is that is not true. And it, it it's it's great because the way this is structured, we're flashing back in time. So we know we know the reader know that this is not this is this is not forever. This is not true. This is this is something that that you will be chasing to to recreate throughout the book and. And won't ever quite get there. Yeah, it's very, very tragic, dramatic irony. Yeah. I also, I mean, I think this is very relatable. Like, I think, I don't know, at least me when I was 16 or so, roughly, felt these kinds of things where you would just have this sense of like, oh, this is so important. This is, this, this moment is so important and, and timeless and I'll never forget this. And, 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 you know, these people I'm with are, are, are you know, so important, so cosmically important. We're going to be friends forever. And um, it's not so much that it's untrue as that it's just kind of a, it more says things about how your brain is developing (laughs) than it does about uh, uh, reality per se. But uh, I remember thinking when I was that age, like no adult ever talks about this. I never really see this feeling expressed in art. So I guess adults don't feel this, which I think is sadly true actually. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is definitely a, the kind of thing that I can I can uh, empathize with with these uh, with these characters. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they're like I think we've all had maybe not friendships friendships exactly like the, these four girls had. Um, hopefully not not ones ending in murder. Um, but but the, we've had the, being young is dramatic, and the moments the moment to moment life of being a teenager is filled with drama, even if it's small things, even if it's like uh, this, this pact, they, this pact of no guys that they have, like they they live in these moment to moment dramas. And I think that the, the prose of the book, like perfectly captures that, like, like the way the laugh and that flash hits Holly again, it's not just a feeling, it's a flash. It's like so dramatic. Like even, like the flutter of Selena's lashes here, like the, the prose emphasizes the drama of something that's just four girls sitting in a, a glade as the sun sets. And that's, I mean, that's really all it is, but that's everything to them. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty cool. All right. All right. Moving on. Um, this, now we've, we're back in the, with the detectives, the detectives are on scene and, and I had a, Matt, I had a really hard time um, pulling 
which part of the interview the, the interviews of all eight characters to to put on screen here um i just picked the first one but like th- these it, it's two chapters worth of interviews and it's probably the greatest way to introduce characters i've ever seen um i love i loved it all i loved it and and i think this was the only time that i felt uh, kevin's frustration was when we break between the dalek interview uh to our four characters and we have a chapter in between there and i was like no i just want to just want to go back to this interviewing um but i guess i can read this one yeah okay because if you've got anything new to add now's the time you know that right yeah i totally do if i knew anything i'd tell you but i don't honest to god tick smile involuntary wet with hope and fear you want in with a witness you figure out what she wants then you give her that big handfuls i'm good like that Orla wanted people to like her, pay attention to her, like her some more. Stupid, it sounds as, but I felt let down, thrown down with an ugly splat like puke. This place had me expecting something under these high ceilings and this turning air that smelled of sun and hyacinths. Expecting something, expecting rare. Expecting a shimmering, dappling something I had never seen before. This girl, the same as a hundred girls I grew up with and stayed miles from. Exact shoddy same, just with a fake accent and more money spent in her teeth. This was nothing special. Nothing. I didn't want to look at Conway. Couldn't shake the feeling that she knew exactly what was going on in my head and was laughing at it. Not in a good way. So, Matt, how did you feel about the interview scenes and how, like, the, each and every movement and eye flutter and, like, flashing is called out and, and shown to us? I just think it's masterful writing. Yeah, I, I think when we were talking earlier, I called it human interaction porn which uh, is one of my favorite genres of fiction is like you have a character who works really well with detectives because detectives have an excuse for being this perceptive uh, where, where your character is, is, you know, reading into every micro expression and, and posture and volume of voice. And, you know, basically the, the character themselves is, is characterizing and painting a picture of the other characters that they're talking to. Um, I think I think Moran is interesting because he's not just doing it passively. He has this this thing, and I'm glad you pulled this one out because he has this thing where he so romanticizes and idealizes the idea of like these wealthy schoolgirls, and he kind of imagines this as being this like impossible Hogwarts, like you know, not literally Hogwarts, but like a like a like more than real. And when he gets there and he sees that oh, like these girls are just humans, like everyone else, and and it's like it, it takes him a long time actually to to understand that that's true. And then also I think he, I think he's also wrong in in a small way. Um, But we'll get to that. Yeah, no, I I think, I think you're, you're spot on there. I think this, he has, he has this really like the, he is kind of mystified by the school. Like the second they get there, he can't stop talking about what the school looks like and, and what this could be and that how this is fundamentally different from, the the place every place that he's been whether whether it was how he grew up or or how he has lives his life like he wants there to be something magical about this place and of course we find out that there quite literally <laughs> maybe is yeah um but yeah i mean like this like throughout the first half of this these interviews you get that feeling that that he is immensely disappointed by. I mean, he says it right here, but that continues through each and every one of the girls he interviews in the first four. And then, I mean, he gets to he gets to our our, our four main characters, and uh, things kind of shift a little bit as he starts to to detect things in them. But yeah, I mean, like we like I I love this character, and I'm fascinated with him and his interaction interactions with Conway. Like as much as I love, like you said that the how what he's paying attention to and realizing in the girls he's doing the same thing with conway like he's every time he says something he's like gauging her reaction like their their first probably half the day they spend together is conway just like continually testing him and he's completely aware of it and it's just like really fascinating reading is they're like kind of sparring silently between them as they go through this investigation. I think it's just like super engaging. That was actually the part that I found most, um, that, that I was most emotionally invested in. Like, like, you know, ultimately I, I, it didn't, it didn't kill me one way or another to find out who killed Chris. I wanted to, to find out how things ended off with Conway and Moran. Um, 
Yeah. And, and, and like you said, you're, they, they have <laughs> what you might almost call a meet cute, uh, where, <laughs> where, where they just don't, <laughs> they just don't get along at all. No, um, and, yeah. and, and, and it's like, it's clear that he's trying to like use her and she's aware of that also. Um, and, and then they, they like, they're like fundamentally very different people. And, and, and he, he, he even has this part where he's thinking like how different she is from the partner that he would choose, like he, how he wants a partner who has violin lessons and wears cardigans and whatever. Um, like, cause he has, he has, again, he has this like romantic view of, of what he wants his life to be. And Conway, if anything, like she, she's, she, she was, uh, she already interviewed all these girls. She's, she kind of like hates this school and, and, and was like sneering at it. And even with her sneering at it, he couldn't stop himself from saying it's beautiful uh, regarding the school, knowing that she would right. think less of him for it. And, uh, and that's just, that actually makes you like him more because it means he's not a complete snake. Like he's, yeah. he's actually, and that's the kind of thing actually that is redemptive about his character that, that ends up, I think making the difference. Right. Because I think you said to me when we were talking about this before that, neither of these characters are particularly great people. Um, they, they, they both are approaching this, this crime using it like with, as a means to an end, mm -hmm. like he sees this as the way to get into the murder squad. And she knows that if she, this, this non solve on her record tied with the fact that she's completely unwilling to befriend or work together with anyone else on the murder squad, is going to um, get her in, in trouble and she's going to eventually possibly get her kicked off or, or get her so hated that she'll never get an important case again. So like it's a means to an end for them, but it becomes more than that as they go. And you see that in, in how, how the characters change the yeah. decisions they make near the end. Yeah. Yeah. They, they exactly. Yeah. That, that's the, that's the best part now. Yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, I mean, <laughs> Kevin says they do mention that he is a backstabbing snake. No, it's just that, though. It's just that he also has redeem redeemable traits as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, absolutely. Yeah. Like it, it, we're heavily implied that just to get onto cold cases, he did some backstabbing. Um, and we'll get to see that. We'll get to hear the story of that uh, later in the story. There are certain things we never find out, though, like, uh, yeah, like what happened, like why he interviewed Holly in the past. Like, yeah. Like, what, yeah what, what, I, my um, assumption was that was another book, but maybe not. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm I'm not sure actually, and, and I think that's a, probably a fairly good assumption. But uh, uh, knowing what I know about *Ton of Friendship*, it may just be something that isn't explained because it doesn't need to be. But, but yeah. I don't know. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Um, yeah. Okay. You want me to read the next slide? Yeah. Yeah. Let's let's do it. All right. So Selena says. They can say what they want. We don't have to care. A breath taken silence as that sinks in. Their minds race wild along its trail. They see Joanne wiggling and giggling and sneering in the court to make the Colmes guys fancy her. They see Orla howling helpless in her sodden pillow after Andrew Moore and his friends ripped her apart. They see themselves trying desperately to stand right and dress right and say the right things under the guy's grabbing eyes. And they think, Never, never, ever, never, never, never again. Break that open the way superheroes burst handcuffs, punch it in the face and watch it explode. My body, my mind, the way I dress, the way I walk, the way I talk, mine all mine. The power of it buzzing inside them to be unlocked makes their bones shake. Becca says, we'll be like the Amazons. They didn't touch guys ever and they didn't care what people said. If a guy tried to do anything to them, he ended up a second that whirls with arrows and flares of blood. Whoa, Julia says, but the small smile is back, and it's her own smile, the one most people never get to see. Chill, this isn't forever. It's just till we leave school and we can meet actual human guys. Leaving school is years away and unimaginable, words that can never turn real. This is forever. So this is one of those Becca moments that you realize <laughs> after the fact that you're like, Hey, um, she just was thinking about totally <laughs> killing about people. about killing a guy who tried to do anything to yeah. them, which is exactly yeah. what happens. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. But yeah, I I I love again like the 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 prose here is so great um, that they're they're ruminating on forever. 
Um, I, I love these, like, the, the one thing that I think the third person point of view that we've talked about works really well here is we get to be in their four minds simultaneously mm-hmm. because, like, they've kind of come together as one now. So we're seeing how, we're seeing how the group is thinking. And I, I love that we have these, um, these group thoughts that are contradicting the things that they're saying out loud. Like we have Julia here saying, this isn't forever. It's just till we leave school. And just like right above that, we had in italics thinking like, this is their, uh, this is their narrative inside their heads. Like never, never, never again. And Mm -hmm. so like, it's, it's, it's contradiction within the prose there. And I think it's, it, that's one thing that third person can really get us is we get to experience them kind of mind melding almost as they become a unit and not those individuals. Yeah. It's their hive mind. I like that. Yeah. Um, uh, Ke- Kevin says that Beck is fucking crazy and, and, and French's evocative prose just kind of hides how crazy, <laughs> yeah. which is, I think it's true because like in this moment, like they're, they're making this, this oath and they go on to like put their hands in and, and do this, this oath. And so in the context of dramatic teens, like making an oath to stay away from guys, her saying, we'll be like the Amazons. And if anyone touches, we'll kill them. Like fits that drama. Yeah. Um, right. It, it's, it, it, that's the thing is any of them could have done it. It just, it's just a matter of like how seriously they're taking this. And the fact right. is Becca was the one who was taking it completely seriously. Right. Um, deadly seriously. Um, and that's yeah. what we, you know, we see all throughout that, like, like Becca is always the one that's not thinking like uh, the, the other student kids start to think about the future and about next year and, and what classes we're going to take and, and what we're going to do after school. And Becca is constantly the one who is not thinking about that. Doesn't know what they want to be when they want to grow up. Like she's always in the now and that this is the most important thing. And they're all that way to a certain degree, but she is kind of secretly, the yeah the most into it i think yeah. we see little bits here like like the amazons and that kind of stuff yeah i want to talk a little bit about the the second paragraph or i mean essentially the first and second where what they're saying is um they they're so stressed out basically by this by what's happening to them essentially they're turning into you know older teenagers and they suddenly find all of these overwhelming social expectations and their their sexualization which they're not comfortable with um and and they, and basically until this moment they all saw it as inevitable that they were just going to get sucked into this black hole of like oh, i guess this is what it is to be a, a, a young woman and then they, they they decide collectively like no actually we don't we don't have to do that because we have each other and that's all we really need and we're just going to not play that game um which is you know i think even as a guy i don't i don't have particularly the same the same angle on it where i never had to deal with you know guys mentally undressing me but 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 you know men are just as much sort of obligated to play the social dance as women and it's it's it feels very overwhelming when you're a teenager and you don't know what you're doing so it's the the part where they they feel overwhelmed and they'd rather just tap out is actually very relatable. Yeah, I, th- I think you're right, and I think I think Chris is the reflection of of the the male version of dealing with this thing, where he's like lost trying to figure out who he is and what he wants to be. Um, and and I, I I love I I love that idea of like they're by making this pact, they are basically intentionally arresting their development. They are attempting to lock adulthood away and the outside world away and just b- stay these four girls that are immune to everything outside of them. I like that a lot. And yeah. I mean that, that is as an adult, we can sit here and say, you know, that's impossible. Like you, you can't do that. You can't stop this thing, but of course they're kids and they, they, on, on some, on some level they believe that they, they can do that. Yep. Yeah. Tringard says, um, uh, that like I think Tringard and Kevin are talking about how um, if if French was using the prose to hide Becca's craziness or to highlight it um, and I think it's kind of both <laughs> um, I, I think like we said like it works into how dramatic she is 
um, that she is like, she's very dramatic, but they're all very dramatic. So her drama doesn't, doesn't seem as crazy as it normally would. Um, I think Tringard says that he's he, knowing that knowing the genre he is, knowing that he's reading a murder mystery, he is actively looking for a killer, um, and and therefore this stuff jumped out to him a little more because you're actively looking for who done it, um, which I guess is is fair. Um, I yeah. I don't know about you, I guessed Becca. Um, I, I I see it see early on. I have to admit that I I um I was listening to the audio book because that's how I do all these. And I was having a really hard time keeping the girls straight in my head for, I don't know how long it took me before I kind of made myself stop and, and think it through. Cause I mean, there's only, there's only eight, eight is kind of a lot to keep track of actually, but it's not, it's, it's not impossible. So I, I really did have to like stop, just like literally stop listening and, and straighten it out of my head. Like, okay, these are the two groups these four in this group, these four in this group, these are the personalities yeah. and kind of line them up. But I think by that point I had um, missed some clues already probably. Yeah. Well, and uh, like uh, the, the, I guess the one complaint what I had, I would have about the book is that the second group, Joanna's group, the Daleks, um, I understand that like you have to have red herrings and you have to have clues that go off in different directions, but like a lot of them are superfluous. Like, Orla is pretty big, um, in, in the grand scheme of things. Uh, Gemma is, I can't even remember what's the fourth one's name. I don't even remember her name. Um, well, jo- jo- Joanna is a leader, right? Yeah. Joanna is a leader. Yeah. I just don't know who the fourth one is. The scared one, <laughs> um, um, that got, yeah. that got burned on her arm. And I think like, I understand like you're, you're trying to do a reflection like of the two groups. So there's four in one group, there's four in another to, to reflect and foil them and show how different these two groups are. But there was, uh, there was a lot with that other group of girls that, that was just there as kind of a mis- misdirect. Allison. Yeah. Thank you, Kevin. It was Allison. <laughs> yeah. I, I guess, I don't know. It's not a criticism per se, other than like, yeah, I had a hard time keep gaining track of eight characters and, but, and I don't, know if all of them were necessary so yeah yeah all right um so this is this is once again i'm gonna pull some flowery prose out here again because this is this is the first night the girls have snuck out where where they really um this is after the pledge after the first time they've been in the grove this is the first time they're doing something forbidden and here we go this is a long one Selena was right. This is nothing like the thrill of necking vodka or taking the piss out of Sister Ignatius. Nothing like a snog in the field or for- forging your mom's signature for ear piercing. This has nothing to do with anyone else in all the world would approve or forbid. This was all their own. After a long time, they st- straggled back to the school, dazed and rumple-haired, heads buzzing. Forever, they sat at the threshold of the window, with their boots in their hands and the moonlight turning in their eyes. I'll remember this forever. Yes, forever. Oh, forever in the morning they're sprinkled with cuts and scrapes they can't remember getting nothing that actually hurts just tiny mischievous reminders winking up from the knuckles and their shins when joanna heffernan flips something bitchy at holly for taking too long in the breakfast queue or when miss naughton tries to make becca cringe for not paying attention it takes them a while to realize it's not just people being annoying they actually are spacey holly actually was staring at the toast for like ever and none of them have a clue what naughton was on about their foothold has shifted. It's taking them a while to get their balance back. Do it again soon? Selena says at break time, through her juice straw. For a second, they're afraid to say yes, in case it's not the same next time, in case that can only happen once and they try to get back and end up sitting in the glade getting colds up their G's, staring at each other like a pack of tossers. They say it anyway. Something's started. It's too late to stop it. Becca picks a, silver, a sliver of twig out of Julia's hair and stashes it in her blazer pocket. To keep. There's another, there's another Becca being creepy. <laughs> yeah, but this, see, speaking of red herrings, though, like I, I was pretty strong on, on Selena for a long time because she's, she's like weird and spacey, and you don't really know what's going on with her, and yeah, like yeah. like Moran kind of can't get a good read on her, and he he like keeps like seeing a flicker of something under the surface, and there's this whole idea of like, I mean, and you never even find out like 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 he. 
at one point he he and Conway basically agree like yeah something happened to her before all this and she screwed up in the head somehow and it's making it really hard for us to get a read on her and she could be capable of anything um and she is a very like different person um than any of the other characters so um, and, and, and so the reason I bring Selena up here in this on this slide is that she's the one who says do it again soon which at that moment really caught my attention and surprised me because I was like Selena strikes me as passive and goes mm -hmm. along with what the other girls want to do and she's the, her being the first one to insist that they do it again I thought was really uh, interesting yeah and it was her idea to do the pact I think I think this was it was her idea to go out at first right yeah Selena was right they say at the top so all of this was her idea um, mm -hmm. okay all, all of this started with her um so she's so then i guess I, I guess she wasn't passive i guess i just have a sense of her being passive which maybe filters in from the, from well, the moran point of view yeah because i think i think yeah in the moran point of view she is a damaged kind of destroyed person who is not really even all there anymore so mm -hmm. that that makes sense but yeah this is this is definitely definitely a, a contrast with that um, mm -hmm. yeah and it's like I, like I, I like that we're doing like things to to reinforce their childishness. Like I love that Selena doesn't just say do it again soon. She's drinking juice out of a straw while she's yeah. doing it. Like like it's like I'm imagining it as a juice box. And I know it doesn't say that, but just like very childhood imagery. Like they they basically like risk getting expelled to sit in a glade at nighttime. Um, just 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 doing something wrong for the sake of doing it. And it's like, it has nothing to do with what anyone else in all the world would approve or forbid. It was just something, some, some way they could push back against the world and do something that was just for the four of them. Yeah. It may be, it'd be reductive, but, but it just seems like a way for them to bond really, really powerful. Right. Right. Cause there's, it, it's an experience that nobody else has. And I think that's part of what I expected the book to go into a little bit was, the betrayal, like not only the betrayal of, of Selena and Chris, but the betrayal of the glade being their place and in, inviting someone else into it. And I, it didn't really go there. Um, I, I kind of did, but I expected that to be a bigger deal. Yeah. I kind of, yeah, I think I see what you mean. I mean, yeah, that, that's one thing it's not really explicitly mentioned here, but this idea that like the glade is, is this essentially magical, um, like spiritual place for for them. Uh, yeah, Matt, is it is it the is it the secret place? I, I, Matt, yeah, yeah, Matt. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes, it, yeah. I, I, that's one thing I liked about it was that fairly quickly, actually, you're like, oh, I get it. It's the secret place. <laughs> <laughs> well, and the, I think I think the secret place it is all over the place. Like I think like the secret place is the literal board. It's the glade. It's the at, at one point every single one of these girls is keeping secrets from every single one of the other girls so like their secret they have each have their own personal secret places um i think it's it's multifunction that title yeah yeah well it, it's a place that that is they are secret but also um it's a place of secrets yeah 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 tringard says uh selena's quote for the why why they're doing it um otherwise it's just about what we don't do and we'll end up going back to the way things were before. There needs to be something we actually do. So this is, I think, in regards to their their pact that if they don't do, if they don't like do something different, then they're just going to go back to being the the girls they were terrified of becoming. Um, if they didn't strike out and claim something as their own that was completely different from anything else they or anyone else has ever done before, they would just fall back into that same type of person. Yeah. Yeah. See, I didn't remember that with Selena. So. Yeah. Uh, need to reread. Um, all right. Yeah, reread it all, Matt. What the I, hell? I, I should re, re listen, uh, I guess. Okay, should... it's time. It's time to talk about magic. Okay. All right. I'm going to do this one. All right. Yeah. <laughs> I just, Becca holds up one thin palm, wavering. I was upset because of, and I just, she closes her fist, the lights go out. This time, none of them scream. Turn it back on, Selena's voice says quietly in the darkness. The light comes back on. Julia has taken the pillow off her head and is sitting up. Oh, Becca says. She has her back pressed against the wall and a knuckle in her mouth. Did I? No, you fucking didn't, Julia says. It's some kind of electrical thing, probably the snow. 
Selena says, do it again. Becca does it again. This time, Julia doesn't say anything. All around them, the air is shivering, bending the light. Yeah, so, so Matt, what was your initial... I think I texted you right after I got to this moment. And I was like, I did not see the magic stuff happening. Um, I think... Your, uh, what was your response to this? Yeah, uh, well, f- first impression is very different from final <laughs> impression, for one yeah, thing. Yeah. Um, I, I honestly was like, this is... Oh, oh I, so actually my first first impression was like someone is either tricking them or, or someone is, or or like one of the four of them has a little like switch over in the corner of their bed. (laughs) No, no, I actually, I actually put this together because they'd already mentioned at this point that one of their, that, that, that the boy, I forget his name was a quote unquote whiz with electronics and, and could rig a fire door and could do all kinds of, of things. So I was like, yeah, I bet that kid rigged up their bedroom somehow or he told the girl how to rig it up so that they could make the lights go on and off and then make the other girl think she has magic powers and they're going to frame her for murder that was exactly where my head was this was way off track but uh yeah. that was where i was from from the first from, from the first uh, way it was brought up and then somewhat later i started to be like is this just pouring a little bit more gas on this idea of like the magical realism of how they perceive things to be like do they actually think this is happening or, or are they just sort of hypnotically seeing the things that uh, can be interpreted as magical that are just normal things? And then the book says, no, that's not it either. So it's uh, <laughs> yeah, it's very yeah, interesting. Well, and, and, and I don't know, like, because the entire time we're at the school, whether we're with the detectives or whether we're with the kids, um, weird stuff is happening like the lights they they're full on levitating stuff at some point we have ghosts we have the burn on um on uh, allison's arm um that they said must have been faked but didn't make sense that way um like chris's ghost constantly coming around like all these things can be tied back together into they were doing it with their powers but that line is never explicitly drawn. Yeah. And the detectives never for an instant take it seriously. Right. Uh, if anything, they, they make fun of it and they, they tell that made up story about the ghost dog. Yeah. <laughs> Which was a great, a great story. Uh, yeah. Kevin says that Tana French does touch on magical realism in her other books in different ways. So he was expecting this to, uh, to come in some fat form or fashion uh, at some point. Okay. I, I mean, like, there, there. The the book kind of goes out of the way to make it seem like it is not just all in their head, right? That this is something that's actually happening, and it works thematically. Like as as the, like the the bond between these girls are is so strong and so magical that they literally have magic powers. But it it is it it. it I, I think Tringard says he he wasn't clear on why it was necessary, and I think that's that that's really what I get back to that it works very metaphorically. But if the book is is claiming that it is literal, which it I think it is, I don't understand why. Like, like yeah, it, I'm not I sure don't... what to make of it either. Like, like I, in fact, I almost would have felt more comfortable with it if there hadn't been a couple of scenes where it's very explicit that, that somebody levitates something. Right. Like, especially at the end when you know somebody like 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 is levitating stuff around, and one of the other girls is like, "We don't do that anymore" because they feel like they've lost connection with with the magic and you know it's 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 and then it's implied that they'll probably grow up and and not believe that they could ever do this at all which you know is a metaphor for lost <laughs> innocence and, and and all that right. and th- that works it's the like you're just thrown off you're just like what what, what? why is this yeah. is, is the murder going to involve telekinesis somehow <laughs> right well and there's there's very specifically ghost hints right like multiple times the detectives feel like they're being watched there's nothing there. Um, I think Kevin mentions the the hand print. There was a handprint at some place by the ghost. Like the book seems to make you really want to fully buy into the fact that yeah, Chris's ghost is literally here, but why? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know. I, I I mean, yeah. It's 
because you don't want to i mean on the one hand you can just be like okay it's a supernatural murder story that's fine but right. it's a it's a very very lightweight on the supernatural to the extent right. that it doesn't even i i guess I, I could like go through and diagram the plot and figure out where exactly the supernatural stuff comes in and whether it does actually matter um like whether there's some specific thing that the detectives wouldn't have figured out if there hadn't been yeah um you know this one thing that happened yeah yeah but i don't know uh, yeah, and, and that's that's kind of where I end up, that like I can sit here and, and talk about how metaphorically and thematically wonderful it is that, that, that as, as a uh, lost innocence being made literal in the gaining and losing of these magic powers. But yeah, it's just, <laughs> I, don't, I don't want it to be real because <laughs> it doesn't make any sense to me. And it seems to contradict, like... <laughs> it doesn't, it doesn't matter in the end. Like it doesn't matter. Like, yeah. Like he, they, they find the murderer through detective work, not through the magic. And yeah, they use, they use the ghost and they use the weirdness as like leverage to get the girls to talk, to get the girls to spill their secrets. But that's just like the dog story. It doesn't have to be real. It just to be something you make up and tell people. I don't know. I don't know. I'm pretty torn on it. Um, I, I think I think Vahail sums it up perfectly here is that it's jarring and doesn't fit and doesn't matter and therefore let's just <laughs> let's just move on. Yeah, I think I think that's fair. Yeah. It felt like I want to put magic in my book, so I'm going to do it. Yeah, um, yeah. So here, this next slide um, is the poem by Catherine Phillips. Matt, I I was hoping to not have to read this because <laughs> I'm not good at poems. Do you want to read it? I can. Well, I, I can read it as long as I okay. get to read it at least one Moran point of view because I haven't got to read any of those yet. Um, oh yeah, yeah, you can get you can do the next two. Okay, is there actually? Okay. I'll I'll do I'll do the poem. I'll do the poem. You can do the next one. <laughs> okay. Here, let us sit and bless our stars, who did such happy quiet give, as that removed from noise of wars. <laughs> yeah. In one another's hearts we live. Why should we entertain a fear? Love cares not how the world is turned. If crowds of danger should appear, yet friendship can be unconcerned. We wear about us such a charm. No horror can be our offense. For mischief's self can do no harm to friendship and to innocence. So this is the poem that is on the wall above Becca's bed. Um, this is kind of the hinge of Becca's motivation, this this idea of friendship is the only thing that matters and and Becca's interpretation of the poem is definitely wrong is is this idea that as long as we are together nothing bad will ever happen to us we don't even need to be afraid we don't need to wor- worry about anything which is as as we learn later the incorrect interpretation right. as soon as i saw this poem above Becca's bed this is when i said she did it okay um, yeah <laughs> I, I definitely didn't have that thought but i yeah cuz i mean she's taking it literally that yeah absolutely not, yeah yeah which which being a young teenager is is understandable but uh right. didn't take her english class seriously i guess yeah yeah well and and i mean it, it's funny because i i looked up Catherine phillips um who who was obviously a, a very real poet from the 1600s who started something called the society of friendship um where a group of people would get together just to be friends and most of her poetry is writing to her friends this is uh, this is a po a poet a poem about a specific friend of hers um, and how important that person was to her. But Becca's removed a lot of the lines here. She just picked the one she wanted. <laughs> really? And yeah. Yeah. This is a much longer poem and you can look at it. I have it linked. I have it linked here. Um, so when I pass out the slides, you guys can go look it up from the link. Um, but she kind of picked just the one she wanted from it. Um, th- I think the poem is a little more complicated than, than Becca treats it. Um, not even that her, her literal read of these lines, but other, other parts of the poem. But uh, the next slide is Moran's reaction to it um, and, and, and what makes him think about what friendship is to him. And this is very telling on what type of character he is. Yeah, yeah. All right. If I made a card to put up on the secret place, me, big grin, in the middle of my mates, arms around their shoulders and heads leaning together, outlines melded into one closes holly and her lot unbreakable the caption me and my friends 
There'd be holes in the paper, cut out with tiny scissors, tiny delicate snips, perfect to the last loved hair. This guy's head thrown back laughing, this one's elbow locked around my neck messing, this one's arm shooting out as he overbalanced and not there. I said people mostly like me. True, they do, always have. Plenty of people ready to see my mate ready to be my mates, always. That doesn't mean I want to be theirs. A few scoops, a bit of a snooker. Watch the match, lovely, I'm on. The more than that, the real thing, no, not my scene. It was these girls' scene, all right. They were diving a mile deep and swimming like dolphins, not a bother on them. Why should we entertain a fear? Nothing could hurt them, not in any way that mattered, not while they had each other. Yeah, so so like you said, this uh, this is his reaction, and it says it says who he is, and it also says his cor- fairly correct take on how seriously they're taking this. Yeah. Um, and I think it's really cool because like Conway, she's a good character and she's a good detective, but she's so like shut to this whole, uh, this whole idea right. that, that she never would have cottoned on to this in the first place. Whereas he, he is almost like hyper susceptible to it d- due to who he is. Yeah. And I think that's one of my favorite parts of the story is like they're, they're, it's very easy to just sit in the story and and question why didn't Conway figure this out a year ago? Um, and it's because she was closed off to this idea of friendship, this idea of of bond between people. Like it, it was all it was all very detached and uh, like a waste of time to her. So she couldn't see the things that he can see. And I, I think that's great because we see here, and we're gonna see later that. He, he's he's admitting that he doesn't have friends and he's saying here it's because he doesn't want them it's not his scene and he's kind of lying here um yeah. because we see we see in, in, and I, I pulled it out a little bit later he's talking about and and that's not true like he yes he makes the choice to be alone but it's not because he doesn't want it um he's just kind of i don't know if he's like unsure of himself or uncomfortable in those situations but he is he's choosing not to have friends but not because he doesn't want to have friends yeah. and like so he can look at these girls he can look at that poem he can look at this this magical bond and this magical place and he can look at it as something that's desirable and something that he, secretly he wants and that allows him you're absolutely right to see things that she cannot yeah, I think maybe he can't deal with the, the amount of vulnerability required to to be in that kind yeah. of a intense relationship because, you know, a big I think it's somewhat fair to say that part of his character is wanting to be liked um and and he, you know, he's very concerned about um you know, the the murder lads having a good impression of him and and all that and some of it is instrumental because he wants to be on the murder team, but also he's just he's just very he just has a very strong sense of what other people are thinking of him. Um, yeah, but the murder team like is is like the school. It yeah. is it is a it is a bubble of a place where you can belong. And he even specifically says that when he's he's talking with Conway later, um, he he is on the outside of this thing looking in, and he wants it. And and he yeah he tells himself it's because his career and he wants to keep moving up, but he wants to be part of this group. And, yeah. And so it, that's that's what he's seeing. That's what he's relating to when he sees the group of girls here. Yeah, and and he fantasizes about having a partner, who yeah. who is basically like he kind of he's he's basically fantasizing about having a best friend. Like like right. The, he's not say, he's not admitting that to himself, but he's fantasizing about having a really close friend who fits kind of this definition of what he imagines as being someone who he could be happy being friends with and i think part of him growing up is realizing that you know in in, in this story and growing as a character is realizing that like you can be friends with people who do not fit your uh right your predefined notion of what that's supposed to look like yeah vahel says here that he frequently mentions his desire to get ahead grew up with nothing and hates the past he sees friendship as a detriment from being his best self and i think that's true but not entirely true <laughs> like <laughs> you know what i mean like yeah. I, I think he, he definitely thinks those things but i think deep down 
he is enamored by the idea of friendship and he he kind of made this choice that because he hates his past because he grew up with nothing he needs to get ahead and he's willing to sacrifice friendship to do it but he he still wants it he secret like he he wants the, those friendships he made this decision but i don't think he's totally happy yeah with it. i think in general like if a human has some bad experiences with friendship they can say to themselves all right i'm forget that i don't need friends but that's never actually going to be true because they're still a human they still have the same basic drives right right okay here's our to, to continue on this conversation we have our long i i pulled all this out here because i had to because i think these next two slides are the book <laughs> i mean like yeah. like the, the, this this takes everything it takes conway it takes moran it takes all the kids into effect here um and i, I don't I don't want to read all this, Matt. I'll read the first slide, and you read you read the second. Um, sure. We could stop here in the middle and talk about them, but this conversation continues on the next slide. Um, yeah. Okay. So this is Moran and Conway. Um, we're in training together, and Conway says they recognize Moran, and he kind of freaks out because <laughs> um, he says, "Oh, what did I do?" And yeah. She says, "Nah, you were grand. I don't think we ever even talked. I only clocked you to start with because of the hair." Conway pulled something out of a hoodie pocket, grimaced wad of tissues after that but i kept noticing because you did your own thing you had mates but you weren't hanging out of anyone all of the rest fuck me they spent the whole time crawling up each other's hole half of them trying to network like the little bastards at colm's if i get all buddy buddy with the commissioner's kid i'll never have to do traffic duty and i'll make inspector by 30 the other half trying to bond like this lot here oh these are the best days of our lives and we'll all be best pals forever and tell the stories at our retirement's dinner i was like what the fuck? You're grown adults. You're here to learn the job, not swap friendship bracelets and do each other's eyeshadow. She shoved clothes down the crowded rail. I liked that you didn't, didn't get sucked into that either. I didn't tell her. A part of me watched my classmates bonding away like Goodo and wished, just like Conway had said, it was my own choice that I wasn't in there swapping friendship bracelets with the best of them. Mostly that made it okay. I said, if you think back, we were kids. Only a couple years older than this lot. People wanted to belong. Nothing strange there, Conway thought, unrolling the tights. I'll tell you, she said. It's not the making friends that gets on my tits. Everyone needs those. But I had mine back home. Still do. Glance at me, I said. Yeah. So this kind of, I mean, this perfectly ties into what we were just talking about, Matt. Yeah. That he kind of admits here that, yes, he made this choice, but, but part of me watched my classmates bonding and, and and wished and wished so he yeah. made this choice he made career ahead but he wants it he doesn't ignore it like conway does yeah yeah and 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 he, he essentially regrets it or, or wishes yeah. wishes it weren't that way yeah. but mostly that made it okay mostly yeah. yeah um and 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 he even i mean I, I like it that he kind of he has this thing where he's trying to stay on her good side, but, but, but this is kind of him talking back where he's saying, you know, n nothing wrong with wanting to bond. So he's basically, basically in a very subtle way, he's standing up for the girls because, right. Because Conway is sort of obliquely ragging on the girls and how like, like, like how ridiculous it is that they're so intense. Yeah. And he's basically saying like, yeah, people want to belong. I mean, that's, that's, that's normal. And, and which is, interesting because not only is it a very important character beat between the two of them but it's a very important character beat to, or it's a very important beat to solving the case because right. they can't solve the case without understanding this yeah um, and, I, and i like i like that you, you she's pushing back or he's pushing back on her rather um because you're right that we when he first started he was so concerned about like her sending him packing that he wouldn't and mm -hmm. so this this is the part of the book where he really starts like subtly at first but like standing up to her and, and pushing back and that, I think, absolutely is key to their eventual cracking of the case. Yeah. And that's the most fun part for me is where they actually start to get in sync and act yeah. like they are partners. And, right. and 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 she starts giving him leeway and trusting him. And he starts, like, relying on her and actually liking her. And, and it's just like, you're like, yes, yes. <laughs> that's yeah. how I was anyway. Oh, yeah. So you yeah, want me to, no. to, move, to move on to the next slide now? Yeah, go for it. Yeah. This is the this is the long one. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. So so they've just so just to to remind, they basically just said, 
uh, Conway's just said, yes, I had my friends back home and, and I still have them. I don't need new friends, basically. And he says, yeah. And then she continues. Right. So you don't need to go chasing more. If you make friends inside some bubble that's going to burst on you in a couple of years, like training or like here, you're an idiot. You start thinking that's the whole world. Nowhere else exists. Then you end up with all this hysterical shite. Best friends forever. She said, you said, I said wars. Everyone working themselves into fits over over they don't even know what. Nothing's just normal. Everything's right up here all the time. Hand above head level. I thought of the murder squad room. Wondered if Conway was thinking of it too. Then you head out into the big bad world, she says. Everything looks different all of a sudden and you're fucked. I ran a hand under the slats of Joanna's bed frame. Orla and Allison, you mean. No way Joanne's going to be hanging out with them in college. Conway snorted. Yeah, not a chance. Here they're useful. Out there they'll be gone. And they'll be devastated. I wasn't thinking of them, though. I meant the gangs that actually genuinely care about each other, like your Holly and her mates. I'd say they'll still be mates on the outside. I hope so. That's something special gliding in the air. Sorry, gilding the air. You want to believe it'll last forever. Could be. Probably even. That's not the point. The point is, right now, they don't give a fuck about anyone except each other. Great, that's cute. I bet they're delighted with themselves. Conway threw a handful of bras back into the drawer, slammed it. But when they get out there, that's not going to be an option anymore. They won't be able to hang out of each other's hole 24-7 and ignore everyone else. Other people are going to start mattering, whether these four like it or not. The rest of the world's going to be there. It's going to be real. And that's going to fuck up their heads like they can't even imagine. That was a beautiful, beautiful accent, Matt. That's, yeah. That's it's wonderful. It's like a, well, like, well like an 8% attempt at an Irish accent. See, the problem is you can't see me right now and see that I was, I had to mute the microphone and cover my face because I was laughing too much. Oh, that's wonderful. That's wonderful. <laughs> see, 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 look, having done the audio book, I, it's, it's, I, I hear this, I hear this prose being read in the voice actors, which are all Irish. Mm-hmm. So it's really hard for me to not read it in, a, in an Irish okay. accent, despite sure. the fact that I can't do an Irish accent. Sure. Kevin says it's like uh, watching Kevin Costner in Robin Hood. The yeah, thank is you. The coming and going in every sentence. That's not a compliment, man. I'm like Kevin Costner. In, in Robin Hood. I'm an in... actor. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, let's talk about the, the actual text and why this is super important. Um, I think I think the interesting thing to me about this is... Conway's not wrong here um, because like the world is, is going to catch up to them and then other people are going to start mattering, whether these four like it or not, the rest of the world's going to be there. It's going to be real and it's going to fuck up their heads. Like they can't even imagine. And that's exactly what happens to them. That th- the world starts coming, that, that, that these feelings, the being a woman and other people and other things starting to matter more, um, really screws them all up and one of them just enough to and she's just crazy enough to take it too far yeah try to try to fix things right. that can't can't really be fixed uh, you almost yeah. wonder i don't know if i had this thought the first time but i almost wonder if conway is speaking from experience here because she seems to i mean it could just be that she's a perceptive person but she seems to be speaking from a bit of experience when she talks about how you know you you're not hanging out with your friends anymore you go out in the world and the world is not, you know, kind to you, and it and it, and it fucks up their heads, like she says. Right. So I wonder if something like this happened to her. Yeah, I think you're probably right. I, I we never get to learn that, but I think I, it it seems like it could be. Um, but the the thing that like Conway's right here, and Conway nails exactly what happens, um, as as Kevin says. But that like. Conway's response to that is then therefore these friendships don't matter and they're not important, which is, which is, I think the wrong read on it. Um, that yes, like you get into a bubble and you just get with these people and, and, and dealing with the outside world can become so intense that someone does something crazy. Um, but like, like that doesn't mean that those friendships aren't important at the time. That doesn't mean that's not a necessary part of life and, and living, um, and yeah. she seems her, her, her 
solution to this whole thing is just never have them then. I don't need them. I don't need that. It's a waste of time. Focus on the things that matter. These bubbles aren't important. And I don't think, and the book is kind of very clearly saying that that's not, that's not entirely true either. Yeah. And and the debate is very clearly sketched out here because she, you know, she's someone who basically didn't make any friends at, at the police academy or whatever, but she's saying, you know, Hey, Moran, I actually admire that you did make friends, but not in a creepy over the top way <laughs> and also not in a um obnoxious networky way which is how she perceives it right. and 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 that's in her mind that's like the correct move is you you be you know cordial and, and affable and so forth but but there's no need to be hanging out of each other's holes which is a another aphorism i'm going to be borrowing from this book it's it's a great one. Yeah. It's really great. She uses it twice on these two slides here, and it's really great. Yeah. Um, yeah. And 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 Moran is actually kind of saying like, yeah, um, but I feel I feel a lack there. Right. So. Well, and and I think they're they're dealing with the extremes, right? The extreme. The, the girls took one extreme, which is they. They, insulated themselves from everything else. And then when anything tried to get into that bubble, they lost their minds. Like, it, it's easy to, to think that Becca's the only one that went a little crazy here, but they all kind of did. Oh, they, yeah, mean, they definitely all did, yeah. Like, like Julia, like, like, well, the only way to stop this is for me to have sex with him. Yeah. What? Well, and, and, what? And, she, and, and that's what, like, so there's a lot of, like, tragic, dramatic irony where they all misunderstand what the other girls are doing. Right. Um, and, 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 yeah, like, Julia is, is exactly doing the same thing becca is doing in, in that she's trying to like repair the magic right by sacrificing something and 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 hers is tragic in its own way is that does that happen to be the next slide or we, yeah we this is I the think, next slide yeah it is the next slide yeah. so yeah should we just read this one sure sure you want me to hey, do this, this time you get to read the uncomfortable all uh, right stuff all right she gives chris a big perky smile and unzips her hoodie She can read every thought scrolling through his head, clear as print. She can see all the red raw places where Selena used to be. The bruised black hole where he thought she was going to be tonight. The bright flashes of him hating Selena and every girl he's been with and Julia most of all. She can see the moment when he decides. He smiles back at her and reaches out, a hand for the condom. Julia knows what to expect. The wind in the cypress rising like a roar. Rising to a roar like a haunting pack. The warning call screaming across the black sky, the clearing heaving and rolling under her, the moon smashing to shards, the sharpest of them all arrowing down to rip her open from the groin to the throat, the smell of hot, dark blood seeping from deep inside, the pain bright enough to blind her forever. Nothing happens. The clearing is just a patch of prissily trimmed grass. The cypresses are just trees that some gardener figured would be low maintenance. The calling sound is still circling but all the spookiness has leached out of it. It's just some bird, yelping mindlessly because that's all it knows how to do. Even the pain is nothing special, just a dull, unemphatic rasp. Julia shifts her arse off a sharp pebble and grimaces over Chris's bobbing shoulder. The moon is flattened to a disk of paper pasted to the sky, pasted to the sky, lightless. Yeah. So like you were, like, like we were just saying, she her hers is tragic because she she basically does sacrifice her share of the magic right that's my reading of this is like it's not that nothing happens it's that now she just sees the the glade as a bunch of trees and sky and and yeah and the the magic goes out of it i love that yeah the the paragraph before is what would happen if the magic was still there like this Mm -hmm. this is this is what would be this is what would having sex would be like in this magic glade this is what what breaking the covenant would be like with this magic yeah. but the reality is you took away the magic and now it's just like dull unemphatic rasp like chris's bobbing shoulder the way this is described is wonderful. unromantic and, yeah it's and, so and like yeah banal and yeah and, the uh, cypress tree the cypresses are just trees that some gardener figured would be low maintenance i love the prose here i love how yeah. this is described the banality of it yeah like it's everything has changed she's made this sacrifice and and nothing will be the same like the the, the group has splintered 
And you're right that you're absolutely right that this is just a different version of what Becca did, except she took it upon herself rather than Becca, Becca decided it needs to be someone else. And it's tragic and awful. And it was, yeah. I had to read it. <laughs> right. Yeah. Like, she, and, and so just to kind of lay it out, like she thinks she's sacrificing herself to save Selena in some way. Right. And Becca thinks she's, she has to make a sacrifice to save both julia and selena right and her logic goes a different direction obviously um so i mean i think this reads my my you know immediate thought reading this was like is this is this all in the sense that the magic is a metaphor which leaving aside the fact that the novel kind of makes it real it it works perfectly well as a metaphor right so taking it as just a metaphor is this is this a metaphor for like losing your virginity is that safe to say yes i I think i think so i think so and like it's it's a loss of innocence which is kevin says it here magic equals innocence equals virginity which is that is absolutely what it is but i don't obviously the book is not satisfied with it being just that but in this moment with this character at least that is what it is yeah and 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 definitely because she essentially puts herself forth as the sacrifice. And, yeah. you know, if you pretend the magic is real, then the glade accepts her sacrifice, I guess. And by yeah. taking away her magic, whatever. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, and, and Tring- what Tringard is saying here is everyone kind of sacrifices themselves in some way. Like Selena sacrifices a, a, a part of her for the group. She gives up Chris. She realizes that she can't, she's in love with this guy. This is, the only like one of the only real interactions between a, 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 like a man and woman we've seen amongst these teenagers like they they generally have a deep level of love for each other and she gives that up for the group um becca gives up someone else for the group julia gives up her virginity for the group i'm trying to think of how holly would fit into this well um, she, holly essentially destroys the group <laughs> yeah yeah um, <laughs> uh, not not on purpose but right yeah, I mean she she's the one who puts up the 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 letter. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm trying to figure out if there's another if there's another way in which she's re- in which in which she sacrifices something explicitly. But uh, well, I mean she uh, Holly's whole thing was she uh, she thought this was external to the group, so she yeah. couldn't sacrifice something until she fully realized that this like she she really thought it was Joanna. Yeah. And she really thought it was that group. So she was going to uh, sacrifice Joanna, I guess. <laughs> right. I mean, she basically that was her idea was like Selena is not coming back from this because right. Selena was so screwed up about it. And, she, and so she made her decision. She was going to she was going to uh, push things farther along. Yeah. And and but, the, you know, so yeah, Tr- Tringard says Holly gives a fractured piece in the hopes of getting something better. Mm hmm. Because the, yeah, the, like the, the end of the book is they're all kind of growing apart. Selena is is fundamentally broken. Um, they're coming up on their their fifth year where they will be living in different rooms, and and Holly sees the group fracturing and mm-hmm. makes a choice to try to br- bring them back together. Which of course you're absolutely right ends up completely destroying them. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, next slide. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so this this is Becca essentially in the middle of her confession, talking about the choice that she made, um, the sacrifice, which we were just talking about. But either I got it wrong, or else I got it right, and that doesn't make a difference. I'm supposed to be punished anyway. The paleness of her face blurred its edges, bled her like watercolor. Could it work like that? Do you think? If crowds of dangers should appear, yet friendship can be unconcerned. That afternoon, I had read it the same way Becca had. Somewhere along the way, it had changed. I said, yeah, it could. Rebecca's face turned towards me. She looked like I had lit something in her, a deep, slow-burning relief. You think? Yeah. That poem you have on your wall. That doesn't mean nothing bad can ever happen if you've got proper friends. It just means you can take whatever's, whatever goes wrong as long as you've got them. They matter more. Rebecca thought about that. 
It didn't even feel the social worker tugging at the leash. Nodded. She said, I didn't think of that last year. I guess I was just a little kid. I asked, would you do it again if you knew? Rebecca laughed at me. Real laugh, so clear it made you shiver. A laugh that dissolved the exhausted walls, sent your mind unrolling into the vast, sweet night. She wasn't blurry anymore. She was the solidest thing in the room. Of course, she said. Silly, of course I would. So what do you make of that? What do you make of, like, th- there's one thing to say that she just misunderstood the what, why friendship was important. And then got sucked up into some magic that made her make this decision to kill someone. But what do you think of the idea that she would have still done it anyway? I think she still um, believes in in making the sacrifice for her friends. Like Mm -hmm. she, she, I mean, because she believes in the magic, like a hundred percent, like, like, like more than anybody else. And so she, she's like, look, we're, I'm, I thought that I thought the sacrifice was that I'm sacrificing Chris. It turns out the sacrifice is that I'm sacrificing Chris and basically myself. Mm-hmm. But this is worth it to save my friends, which is what all of them are are always trying to do for each other. Um, so it doesn't even occur to her that she that like that she would make the choice of like, oh, if 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 I also have to pay a terrible price, then I wouldn't do it. No, that's ridiculous. I, of course, I would still do it even if I had to t- pay a terrible price. I mean, in her mind, she did pay a terrible price because she didn't want to kill Chris. In fact, that was the whole kind of heartbreaking thing is is she she would have been happy to kill almost any of the other boys. <laughs> yeah. And then it turns out to be Chris, the one guy who she actually thinks is like a decent person. And yeah. she's like, oh, I get it. This is supposed to be horrible for me and something I don't want to do. And that's her. And, and But she's not. Yeah. yeah. That's her logic anyway. Yeah. Yeah, Kevin says this is the point where the magic as a metaphor breaks down for him um, because magic is her motive. And yeah, I think that's true, but it could still work as like the magic of friendship. Right. (laughs) Right. Exactly. (laughs) It's like it's like it's not I don't think it's like she is fully bought into like not just the fact that they can float stuff or turn lights on and off, but that their their unit is strong and powerful and unique and needs to be kept together no matter what. And that doesn't necessarily require the literal magic. Um, Mm -hmm. It's just, it's just the the magic of friendship, like you said. So, (laughs) I mean, it's, it's terrifying and disappointing and all those things, but also I get it. I get like, I get why some demented kid would see this. Yeah. I mean, people, yeah, um, yeah. Kevin says that's not a thing that leads a normal person to killing someone. And I don't think, I don't think Beck is a normal person. I mean, neither is Selena. I don't think, right. I mean, well, there's another thing where like, I don't know, perhaps this is revealing it too much, but like when I, when I was 16, I, I like thought I was going crazy, but all that was happening is like <laughs> your, your brain is turning from a kid brain into an adult brain. And it's not a pleasant experience. I wasn't, I wasn't going crazy. I was, I was just like, what is going on in my head? I don't understand what's going on, you know? And, Mm -hmm. and there's a lot of, there's a lot of chaos in that time period. And I mean, yeah, I really think that if you take a normal person and you, and you put the right pressures on them, all they need is a little, little push as a wise man once said. Um, and, and you can, uh, you probably make him kill somebody. Wow. So you hear that everyone, Matt thinks everyone's a murderer. That's what the Joker said, Scott. Come on. <laughs> it's, it's not. It's a movie. It's a movie, man. It's a movie. It's. It's not. It's real. <laughs> no. Um. I, no. I definitely see what you're saying, and I think th- one of the triumphs of this book to me is how it kind of perfectly captures that feeling of being that age. We we talked about this already, but um, like. Th- It is a very confusing time. It is a time where everything is important. Everything is the most important thing. You're absolutely right. Your brain is changing. You are growing. You you don't understand what's going on. And these girls were desperately clinging to the time before that change. And, Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think, I think Tana French's ability to capture that, that slice of life that, 
most people don't think about regularly. Like, like this, the, the one of the reasons this book worked on me so well is, is because it, it brought back memories of that time. Right. Like, yeah, you yeah, don't absolutely. think, you don't think about that every day. You don't think about what it was like when you were a kid, what it was, what it was like to be a teenager, but you read something like this and all of a sudden you remember the thoughts you had and you remember the yeah. drama and you remember how everything was life or death and like how much your friends matter to you and how much like girls mattered and how confusing that all was. And it, it's, I, I love how she captured that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I would even say like, it's not, it's not, it's not so much that I never think about being that age. It's that I never think honestly about being that age. Right. right. And, and th this book did bring back a lot of memories that I hadn't thought of in forever. And they were the memories of like, Oh yeah, I would get like incredibly nervous just before going to see my, my friends. And it's like, well, they're your friends. Why would you feel nervous? Says adult brain. Because I, as an adult, I don't care anymore. But as a kid, you were so like, that was the most important thing. And of course you cared. Yeah. And, and it would be insane not to be, nervous about that yeah so yeah yeah um one thing tringard said to go back to where we were talking Ju julia did sacrifice her whole self not just her virginity the pact was made because she wanted to be something different and better more than just about sex so remember like she was the she, like everyone thought she was a whore and that's what led to this whole pact thing and then she she breaks the pact in order to save the group and basically gives up that, that thing that she cared yeah. most about. She basically tells him that, that all the rumors are true. And yeah, yeah, that's true. And Tringard pulls out this great quote here. Um, uh, the, the, the owning their own sexuality is part of the pact. Um, this mix of roaring rage and a shame that stains every cell, this crawling understanding that now their bodies belong to other people's eyes and hands, not to them. This is something new. And that's that's something they're they're fighting back on. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great it's a great quote, Tringard. Um, <laughs> and Vahale says, of the four friends, three of them betrayed the group. Selena, Holly, Julia. Only Becca stayed strong. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> Through murder. <laughs> yeah. Well, it, I mean, you know, j just to talk about the magic for a minute, like, if you do take this as sort of like a druidic magic thing human sacrifice is right right in there you know that's the yeah. uh that that would be the thing that the that the uh that the animal spirit god would be demanding actually so yeah so good job becca you did it yeah you maybe you tapped right into that yeah i mean maybe your three remaining friends will actually maintain their their wonderful friendship for their whole lives and they won't yeah. they won't be blown apart by your actions and never talk to each other again who knows <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's maybe. one thing we don't we don't actually know. Like, like right. the the book. I mean, not to skip ahead, but like it ends with them like in this death grip hug, right. including Becca, who you would think at least Selena would be would be furious at, but Selena actually loves Becca more than Chris. Like, so right. I mean, it, it, Selena gave up Chris for them. Yeah, and and they have to pry her away, and, and yeah, I, I don't. I don't actually get the sense that they're going to be, you know, sundered by this. I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. But, but that, is that good? I mean, like that's, that's like to, to, to echo Conway <laughs> for a bit here. Like that's part of life. That's part of growing up. Like even Holly sees it with her mom. Like you don't stay friends with the people you were friends with in high school. You, you drift apart. And, and yes, like, if you happen to see each other 30 years later, you are right back to that time. You can, you can recapture that in an instant just by being around each other. Because even if you don't remember it, even if you don't talk, that is still part of you. And that friendship will still always be part of you. But to try to artificially keep this together, to arrest your development, um, to keep a friendship together is I think ultimately damaging. Yeah. Artificial. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. I'm still friends with yeah. people I went to high school with. Like, Michael is is on this podcast all the time, but right. but like, it's it's not the same. It's not the same kind of friendship. We don't see each other every day. We don't talk to each other every day. We are not involved deeply in each other's lives like we were back then. It's yeah. different, and and you have to be willing to let that difference, let that change happen. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, yeah, I've 
I mean, I don't know. I can admit I've, I've, always, I've like struggled with this idea of like, I always feel like I'm letting myself and other people down because I don't keep in touch with high school friends the way I feel like I should, because I do feel like there's this immense value. I, I was maybe never as crazy as these girls are, but I, I do feel like there was this immense value in those friendships that I've just like blown off essentially. And, but you know, I mean, what you're saying is rational because it's like, well, no, Matt, you can't actually recover that because the whole basis of that was that you were seeing each other every day in, in prison. Right. I mean, school. Um, <laughs> and, and it was a, you know, a very intense bonding experience that can't really be replicated with a phone call every month or whatever, whatever would be the, the optimum, you know, I don't yeah. even do, I don't, I don't even do a phone call a year in, in, uh, in a lot of cases, but, uh, yeah, no, yeah, I mean, yeah, I think, I think, uh, the cultishness of the friendships as Vahale says is the problem. It's not mm -hmm. the friendships themselves. It's, it's, it's trying to keep it up in the exact same way and totally being resistant to change. And that's, I think the whole thing with the quote, it's like, it's not like, it, it's not that things are going to change. It's not like things are going to get hard. It's not like your friendships are going to be tested and, and maybe even crack and splinter a little bit. But as long as you, call your friends important you can take it and mm -hmm. that it, that matters mm -hmm. and speaking of friendships that matter we got this slide okay is this my turn or yours i can't remember uh, it's yours okay matt said resentfully <laughs> you can read it go for it read it uh, oh really you're gonna give me yeah. that oh go thanks bud okay costello that's, fr that's friendship guys that's friendship yeah look at that Costello, Conway said, and left it like she was deciding whether to keep talking. The people with the five-foot concrete mug handle had it floodlit, make sure we could all approach it 24-7, or make sure no one nicked it to go with its eight-foot concrete mug. Conway said, they haven't replaced him yet. Yeah, I know. O'Kelly was talking about July, something about after the mid-year budget. Unless this goes tits up, I should still be in the good books then. If you were thinking of applying, I could put in a word. That meant partners. You want him, Conway. You work with him. Me and Conway. I saw it all clear as day. The slaggings from the butch boys. The sniggers rising when I found the gimp mask on my desk. The paperwork and the witnesses that took just a bit too long to reach us. The squad pints we only heard about the next morning. Me trying to make nice. Making an easier to myself instead. Conway not trying at all. It means you can take whatever goes wrong, I had said to Becca, as long as you've got friends. I said, that'd be deadly. Thanks. Yay, character growth. Yay. <laughs> I, I loved this moment, and I loved how it happened. Yeah, and I was, I was, not, I was actually anticipating him being a, a piece of shit at the end <laughs> frankly like well, like i was well, really have, i was happy that it did, did this the thing we skipped over is that we, we skipped over holly's they, they've decided that holly is the primary suspect so they have to call detective Mackey in. so yeah. holly's father uh comes in and there's a lot of really great verbal sparring between all of them and it gets to a point where it becomes very clear that Mackey is trying to split them up by revealing truths about them uh Mackie tells conway the, the the truth of moran of of what moran did to get ahead and uh kind of lays it out to to um moran as well about what being associated with conway would do for his career and we get to watch um first of all conway thinks that or moran thinks that conway fucked him over and then could take all the credit and could do this all himself, but decides not to, which is which is awesome and exciting. Like he, for once in his life, decides not to do the greedy thing, yeah. the asshole thing, which is great. And then we have this moment here at the end where, like, Conway never wanted a partner. Um, this was never about Moran. She she brings it up. She brings up the idea of putting in a good word for him. This is not Conway. Try, uh, this is not Moran trying to manipulate her. Um, this is her thing. And he chooses the friendship. And yeah, okay, he's going to get ahead. <laughs> he is. But he's going to get into Murder Squad like he always wanted to. But he's also basically kind of dooming his career 
um, because he'll never be he'll never be an accepted part of the group. Um, He'll never be in that bubble. But he will have a friend and he will he can take all that with a friend like Conway. And that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's he's getting what he wanted, but not as he imagined it. And right. It's just exactly what you said about about the partner he imagined. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a really wonderful moment. And I love I love that'll be deadly. I mean, I think that's just Tom French having fun. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, that's like I got to say it like that. Yeah. 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 I I, I love I mean, I I really was man. the, the, The whole part where he where he goes off by himself. And, and he actually, I think he actually says like, fuck Conway. Yeah. And he's like, he's, he, he really thinks that she has just dumped him. Right. And, and he, and, and I think what's interest like what's interesting about that is that he's crushed by it. And that shows yeah. us and him how much he was enjoying this and how much he cared. Right. And he, he didn't even realize that he cared that much until he thought that she had was just like disgusted with him and was going to throw him out. Yeah. Um, yeah. And and, and yeah. we, I told I don't know about you I totally bought into it I bought into the fact that Conway just fucked him over I did too um, and then it's like you realize that that's not what happened and I was so happy I was so yeah. happy that she was not manipulated like that yeah that's, that's uh, another great moment is when they like when they see each other again after that yeah and they're both like smiling like kids and <laughs> like like we did it yeah like friends like yeah, yeah they're like friends yeah yeah Kevin is saying. <laughs> Which of us, which of the Daily Planet podcasters is most likely to pull a Becca? I mean, I feel like it's Matt. He yeah, just said I mean, that he's said on, that everyone's like a, a shove away from becoming a murderer. Based on what I've been saying this podcast. <laughs> I'm, I'm also the one who who the, the, has been lying to you about the details of another book for for a year. So Yeah. Just, just all these secrets, Matt. Yeah. Look yeah. at this stone face. It's like you're not even moving. Yeah. He's like a psychopath. What's wrong with him? <laughs> All right, it's time for the, the the final slide here. Okay. Um, I guess I will read this one. All right. The song starts so small, fading up through the hip hop. It takes a minute to reach her, then it hits her like a shock in the chest, like she's breathed air made of something different. Remember, oh remember, remember, oh remember. I don't know how you sung the tune, so I'm just well, gonna say it. Remember, oh remember, back when we were so. Did you Google the song? Because I Googled the song. And uh, I didn't know it was a real song. I it's was just not, singing it the way not. they sing it on the audiobook. Oh, well, that's cheating. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's crystal clear, every word. It surges away the sound of the engine bowels. The, it surges away the sound of the engine, bowls away the hoodies hooting. It carries them over the canal and all the way into town. It soars the bus through chains of lights, all flashed green, leaps over speed bumps, slaloms it, it two-wheeled around jaywalkers. Never thought I'd lose you, so I never thought I'd find you here. Never thought that everything we'd lost could feel so near. Holly listens to every word of it straight through. Chorus. Chorus again. Again. And she waits for the song to fade. Instead, it keeps going, and it rises. I've got so far, I've got so far left to travel. The bus skids towards her stop. Holly waves goodbye to the hoodies, open-mouthed and baffled, looking for an insult. Too slow. And flies down the rocking stairs. Out on the street, the song is still going. It's fainter and tricky, flickstering between traffic sounds and student gang shouts. But she knows what to listen for now, and she keeps hold of it. It spirals in front of her like a fine golden thread. It leads her nimble and dancer-footed between rushing suits and lampposts and long-skirted beggar woman up the street towards Steven. So that's the end of the book, Matt. Yeah, I thought it was an interesting choice to bring it full circle, to, to basically bring the, the the girls timeline which was exclusively in the past up to essentially the moment when the story begins yeah um, I didn't I didn't know if it was necessary per se but but I like it I also like the idea that and I hadn't I honestly hadn't noticed this until you pulled this slide out and I, and I was staring at it and realized like hey you know this is this song I mean the song is basically about her predicament yeah and and is this a magic is this magic is it leading her? It's basically saying like the song is 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 magic, you know, metaphor magically making the bus like soar and flash and and slalom through the streets to get her to Stephen to get her to, to Moran so she can give him this thing that's going to blow her group apart. Like that's 
uh, I don't know. I'm having trouble seeing it otherwise now, actually. Yeah, no, I think, I think, yes. I mean, like, we say very clearly here that the song should have, like, there's no reason the song didn't fade. Um, like, the song keeps going, even as she walks away from it, it's still going. Like, it, it is magic on some level. Yes. Yeah. And and the, the part that is confusing to me, Holly waves goodbye to the hoodies, open-mouthed and baffled, looking for an insult. Why are they open-mouthed and baffled? What just happened? Is it because of the way the bus was driving? Is it because oh. of the, the craziness that was happening with the bus? Um, I, 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 I read it as just, uh, like, if, if some... If, if, if you're with your mates on the bus and some girl like gets up and then turns and looks at you and then, and then waves and then gets off the bus, I guess you're going to be like, was that sarcastic? What, what, what was she trying to say? And then she gets off and it's too late. I don't know. I, I, yeah. yeah that, that's how I read it. Hey, yeah, I, that, I can, that could definitely be true. Yeah. Pull the audience. <laughs> yeah. What do you, what, what, I guess yeah, audience, what is your, what is your read on the song? Is the song magic is the things that it's saying, literally happening is it is is all the lights turning green as it goes through automatically is it leaping over speed bump is it slalomly two wheels like is it is it literal um yeah i'm very like it certainly seems to be right that that like that the, the the song she it's, it's something she's been she's been searching for the entire book um and, and you're right it's exactly about her predicament never thought i'd lose you never thought i'd find you here Never thought that everything we lost could feel so near. Um, I've I've got so much left to do, and and she and it's it's pushing her towards this thing. And yeah. even even after even after the song should have been over, it keeps going. Um, and now she's got it. Yeah, I, I like what what Kevin's saying. It's it's her identity. Um, and and I think that that fits into this line. Um, it's it's fainter and trickier but she knows what to listen for now. So she's, she's found a part huh. of herself. She's found part of her. Um, and, and I, th- yeah. I think the song is her identity works because yeah, well, like we're seeing the, 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 the book starts with her about to enter boarding for the first time. And she doesn't know who she is. The, the whole reason for Holly to go into boarding is because she has this group of friends and she wants to be with them. She wants to be in this bubble she she um she forces her parents by manipulating her parents into into letting her board with them because these these three girls are the most important things to her and they all want to be the four of them want to be together and so she's kind of that's what she's grabbing onto and there's this song playing through all of this that she's trying to hear and she can never get it she, she, and then yeah at the end she finally finds it and she knows what it is and she knows what to listen for now and it's leading her through her life and it's leading her towards the right choices and it's interesting. And this is the right choice in the sense that it brings justice to Chris. Yeah. It's not, it's not the right choice if her goal is to keep her friends together, but it's the right choice. Right. Right. Um, I am wondering though, like this, this definitely, so, so there's this scene between, you know, between the last scene, between the last slide and this slide where, uh, yeah, her mom, uh, or, you know, she's, she's talking with her dad, uh, who's, who's, um, uh, Mackie, Mackie, right. And then her mom comes yeah. home and her mom tells this really, I think fairly affecting, like, like good, you know, good piece of the, of the book actually that I, that I appreciated where she's, you know, she's a, however old, you know, late thirties, whatever. And she's talking about her friend. Uh, from from high school, basically, who she just saw after not talking to her for decades, and how you know how they slipped back into acting like how exactly how they used to act, but how things are different now, and and you know her friend didn't become the person she expected to be, and and one of their other friends they still haven't talked to, they don't know, you know, this, for all they know, something terrible has happened to her, basically, and so this is in context of that, basically. If anything, that conversation drove Holly to make this decision where, where she's like, oh, I can't let that happen. And trying, I'm trying to pin down where this song falls in context of that. Like, is she deciding, is, is the song saying, um, is the song saying you are going to, to, to kind of lose touch with your friends? 
and that's okay? Or is it saying, I, I don't know. I'm, there, there's a few different interpretations bouncing around in my head. I haven't quite nailed down. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know. I don't know if, I mean, the, the conversation with her mom kind of pushes her towards trying to get the group back together. Cause I think it's after the conversation with her mom that she pulls them together to do the, the art project, I believe if I'm remembering this correctly. And then it's when she's talking with Selena and she realizes for the first time, maybe just how bad Selena is and gets the idea of maybe if the killer gets justice, you can move beyond this uh-huh. or if the, if the victim gets justice rather. Um, so, I mean, yeah. I don't think it's like, I don't think it's like, yeah, I mean, I guess it is, it is her mom, her mom's story pushes her to this moment. Yeah. And I'm not sure how that ties into the song specifically. Um, it seems related. I'm just having a hard time nailing it down. I mean, I like, I, I like it regardless. I'm just yeah, tr- gunning for the correct interpretation. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Tringard said here's something I like. The two timelines is contrasting. The girl's timeline is a countdown to the deconstruction of their friendship. It ends with Holly trying to save it. The detective timeline is built up solving the mystery, but also building of a partnership and friendship. Yeah, I think that's true. Yeah. Yeah. As as this friendship, this group seems to come to an end. A, a new friendship is born from it. Yeah. Yeah. It's like it's like poetry. Yeah. It rhymes. It rhymes. <laughs> it's it's the it's the ring structure, Scott. <sighs> <laughs> Stupid. All right. Um, so that's all the slides we had. Is there any questions or comments, you guys? Anything we didn't talk about that you wanted to? This was this was probably one of the longer books we did. So so you know, catching everything was was rather tough. So um, there's a whole lot more we could talk about. We're we're coming up on two hours, Matt. So all right. Um, but we'll just give we'll just give a second. Uh... <sighs> Kevin, I'm not answering that, Kevin. I'm not answering it. I'm not even going to say the word. I, I can't see what he said. What did he say? Do you, do you want me to tell He asked, who do we ship Stephen with? And I'm very <laughs> angry. I'm very angry. Oh, the headmaster, obviously. What? <laughs> it's ridiculous. Look, for, a while there, have... for a while there, I thought he was being shipped with some of these teenage with, girls. Yeah, and I was getting with, very uncomfortable. With, with, with Joanna tries to ship with him. I know. Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. So, so you, Matt, I I don't remember if you if you if you said this or not yet. Do do you liked this better than Tana French's other book, uh, Emotional Wreck, notwithstanding? I think so. Um, I I that was a long time ago. I don't I, like the other. The character is very different, and um, I yeah. I just there's a lot of features about this book that you know it's it's, it's interesting. I don't know. It's very difficult to be objective about the other one. I recommend it. Huh. I, re- I definitely recommend it. Um, but uh, I, I think this one was better, probably. Is the is it structured similarly, or is this kind of a unique oh, structure? You know, I really don't remember. I, I don't think it is, but I could be completely wrong. I'm. I here's the thing. I mainly, I really just remember one point of view character. Okay. But if you told me no, Matt, there was a second point of view character, I would accept that <laughs> because. That this was ten years ago, probably. So, <laughs> wow. Yeah. Um. I, I I have not read any of her her books, like I said. Um. But um, I I like. I, this feels like she wants to keep doing like this is book number five, and it feels like she wants to keep doing detective stories. But she adds something else here, like, and I don't know if that's that's a common trait amongst all her books that the the murder mystery is just kind of a backdrop to what she really wants to do or not. Um, but it seems like um, this was like specifically designed to to ha- like explore something she hadn't done before outside of just I'm telling a mystery. Yeah, I, I think what she does, and this is extrapolating from two books, is she takes the themes she wants to talk about. She has the merger relate to those themes. She has the main the point of view character relate to those themes in a different way, and and the plot is the parallel resolution of multiple plot tracks all, all sort of tied together by this theme. Okay. Gotcha. Gotcha. Cool. Yeah. 
my my air conditioning just turned on and it's very okay. loud and I I've, I've turned it off with my phone but it's going to keep making a noise for another 30 <laughs> seconds cuz that's what it does. Um, that's okay. Right, yeah, but, go ahead. Vahale says they really liked uh, the writing style character story and just about everything about it. And that's, that's where I am. Um, I really love this. I don't have a lot of time to read for fun, but now that I finished worm, maybe I do. <laughs> and maybe I'm going to jump into the next ton of French book. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. My mom recommended uh, the, the likeness. She's, she's actually been wanting me to read the likeness for, for years and years. And I always told her, <laughs> I always told her, no, I can't can't ex- subject myself <laughs> like, to liter- literally cannot <laughs> yeah but but now now the curse is broken so i, I think i think my next donna french is going to be the likeness cool cool yeah i'm, I'm probably going to go in the woods because okay. i have that book already because i was originally going to start reading that one and then this uh this came along so cool um but we're, we have another book to read matt and oh. and what book is that do you ask i ask it's it's a tie oh, no. <laughs> it's a tie um, uh, we had an exact tie between the lies of Locke Lamora and Annihilation. Um, both got 31% of the vote. So here's what we're going to do, guys. I'm going to make Matt pick which one he wants to oh, read. God. Not right, right now? <laughs> yes, right now. Oh, God. Uh, <laughs> um, Matt, oh, man. Matt, I, I, I was... I was planning to do this to you the whole time, and I knew you were going to be mad at me, and I wanted to do it anyway. Oh, God. You can flip a coin, or you you can cop it out and say to to the the handful of our listeners that are still left, they can vote. That that would incentivize them being here. (laughs) (laughs) Such a cop out. Um, Such a cop out. Yeah, well, I'm... No, I don't want to... I I think I'll just... um, I've... I actually want to read both of these. Is the problem? Um, I, I've heard, well, I, I've heard good things about Lies of Lockamora, and a director, the director who directed um, Deus Ex Machina, uh, Ex Machina, yeah. is um, going to be directing the movie of Annihilation. So, I want, I, I think I might say Annihilation because I might want to read that before the movie comes out. Does that make sense? Yeah, to it you. Does. Yeah. You want me to you want me to flip a coin, Matt? No, I think I'll think I'll just go with annihilation and then all the fans who voted for Lock Lamora can hate me. No, I think I think well here's what we do. Our our runner up book appears in the next month's poll. So yeah, okay. if people are really passionate about Liza Lock Lamora, we will do that the month after this. Um Okay. So I think I think that's the best of both worlds. But yeah, so the book for next month is Annihilation by Jeff Man- Vandermeer. As Matt said, the writer and director of Ex Machina is doing a an adaptation of this. Uh, the full trailer just came out this week, which is actually why why I think we we had this on the list to begin with, um, because I saw that trailer and was like, oh, okay. Um, so a little bit of uh, t- time and dating of this whole thing. Um, it's only the 15th of, of September, but we've got the holidays coming up. So we are going to do the next book club on Friday, January 26th at 930 Central. Um, that's a month and a half away, I know, but I wanted to give everyone a little more time because of the holidays. And also um, because we're a little off on, on months here. Like this, this book was technically November's book club book but it's mid-December when we're discussing it. So I wanted to get us back on a set schedule. Um, so we're going to... St- my, my new plan is the final week of the month. Every month we will do a book club and we will just deal with however messy that gets. Like, I want to stay on the books. I want this to be January's book and then we have a February yeah. book and then we have a March book. Um, and so I, I think this to, is the way to do it. Yeah, I just have to be like the last Friday of the month. I think that's right, right, yeah. That's, that's basically reasonable. what we're gonna do. So the last Friday of the month will always be a book club, and uh, and I like I I was always worried in my head about giving people enough time to read the book, but I, what I found that I was doing and what I've noticed some of the people in our Discord doing was you're waiting till the last week, a week and a half, mostly to read the book anyway. Yeah. So um, that's exactly what I did. I finished this book on last Sunday, so. The time doesn't really matter <laughs> yeah. as long as there's enough time to be able to liter- physically read the book from page one to, to page whatever. 
um, it'll be enough time. So, yeah. I see, agree. yeah, Trinkard right there. He read 50% of this book today. That's see. So, giving people a month, giving people four weeks exactly doesn't really matter. What we're going to do is we're going to pick the book on the next book club, and then a month later, the last Friday of the month, we will do the thing, and that's just what we're going to do. All that's right. what we're going to do. Yeah. So, once again, after the break, the holiday break, we will come back, and Friday, January 26th, the end of January, we will do Annihilation. I'm very excited about this. Um, yeah. Yeah, me too. I'm, uh, th- and this will be exciting, because then the movie will come out, and we'll get to do a multimedia yeah. analysis. Yeah, well, I, I don't think the movie's going to be out for a while. <laughs> I think it's late next year, but... Late next year, wow, okay. All right, I, I figure whenever I see a full trailer, I figure it's not too long, but okay. Yeah, I but um, it, we, the, one of the other things we did is I've been telling people to submit book club ideas to me at, at dailyplanetfilms at gmail.com, and uh, Matt, I do a really poor job of sifting through those. Um. And so I decided to create a Google Doc, um, and basically that's what we're gonna do. So I have a Google Doc, a Google Form rather, where you can fill out what book you want, and they'll submit it, and we can track them, and it'll be a lot neater. Yeah, that way. that's that's a great so idea. I am going to put that in the show notes. Uh, if you're listening on tomorrow on the podcast, um, I will. I will put it on put that in the show notes. Um, I will also have it in the Discord if you're a patron. I will also put a tweet that out via the Daily Planet Twitter, and it'll be on the website as well. So you will have a link to that form. You can submit books whenever you want. It doesn't matter when. We will look at them all and and make and whittle it down to five whenever. So that's our plan. Yeah, Annihilation is part of a series. It is it is book one of a three part series. Um, but we felt that. I asked around and we felt that the, the the story itself is complete enough to where we're not just totally going to be like, maybe this theme is concluded in the next one. So yeah, I don't know. I don't know about the film though. Um, if the film was covering just the first book or if the film's covering the whole story, no idea. Yeah. Yeah. Right, I mean, well, if, that's yeah. Sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say if, it, if it's really good, I'll just probably read the series, but yeah, I think I will too. But first, I gotta read me some some ton of French. Yeah, got a lot of reading now. Yeah, yeah. All right, so let's let's finish the thing off. Thank you guys so much for tuning in live. Um, for those listening on the podcast, like we say always, because I know there's like there's like 150 people, give or take, that listen on the podcast. Yeah. And don't come listen to the live tweet. Maybe it's just because because it's a Friday night or whatever. But it's fun. Like I like having these people to talk to. So. Consider hanging out with us next time. Yeah, you could be part of this. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. And if you like what we do here at the Daily Planet and want to see more of it, head on over to our Patreon, patreon.com slash dailyplanetfilms, and consider donating a dollar a month or whatever else you can afford. You get access to our private Discord server, as well as the ability to vote for which books we cover and tons of other cool benefits. Check it out. Yeah, that's right. And if you have any questions or comments or just want to reach out to us, you can always find us on Twitter at Daily Planet Films or email us at dailyplanetfilms at gmail.com. We will see you all in a month and a half on January 26th, Friday at 930. We will be back with Annihilation. See you next month. Yay. What is Rabbit? <laughs> Vail asks Daily Planet Films movie night on Rabbit. What's Rabbit? <clears throat> uh, sounds familiar. I don't know what that is. What's the hell? What's what's Rabbit? <laughs> Kevin, that took me a second to understand what he's saying. He said, "You too could make fun of Scott's abhorrence of shipping." Rabbit is a video sharing site, a way to watch things with fans. That would be fun. Like you just put on a movie and like chat about it. Yeah. That'd be cool. So, I I mean, I I assume it has some better features than using Google streaming like this. I mean, it it must. I don't know if YouTube will let me put a a movie. Yeah, that makes sense. I can't post a link. 
Do it. Did I? Did, did I do that? <laughs> Unfortunately, I can't read the commentary today, so I can't uh, be chatting. Oh yeah, yeah. Matt's can't read y'all, like we said. I think annihilation is is gonna be be fun. Sorry, sorry to put you on the spot, but also not sorry. <laughs> no, it's it's fine. No, the problem, you know, it's a shame. I think uh, almost any other month, I feel like I would have been able to just be like, you know, just just pick one. But th that I actually really, I've, I've there, there's always I've where is it? I guess it's on the something awful book book forum. People are always recommending Liza Lockamora and discussing Liza Lockamora. So uh, that's it's been on my mind for a long time. Yeah. That makes sense. Oh, great. The war chapter is out. Thanks, Kevin. Thanks. I'll read that. Yeah. In a month and a half. Yeah. I'm. And meanwhile, while we're on this live stream, I'm going to go strangely quiet and you're going to hear some typing sounds and then I'm going to wait. What are you doing? I was pretending to go read Ward right now and then realize that I'm not on the internet. Yeah. Ha. And, that, and that, that was kind of funny. Ha. Anyone watching me would have got a good laugh out of that one. No one's watching you, Matt. You're just a still image. I know. I still look like that. Well, that was taken today, wasn't I'm it? I'm standing in front of a window. Oh, oh, that part. <laughs> Oh no, what did I do? What did I do? This is Matt. Matt, I'm, I'm making you take over the whole thing. Okay. Hi everyone. I can't see what you're saying, but I'm just gonna just gonna vamp here. You know, every time I use the word vamp, you make fun of me and then you use the word vamp <laughs> and it's just fine apparently. It's uh it's a funny word. I learned it from you, Scott. I learned it from watching you. What's that from? I don't remember. I don't remember either. Matt, you've taken over the stream. Um, vamp is basically, I don't know what it comes from, but it's basically just like, just talk. It's like, uh, fill, fill, fill air, right? Yeah, basically fill air. Yeah. Like... If, if we're trying to do something else or set something else up, please fill air while I do this. So, like, if I needed to go make Matt's face really huge on the stream, like I just did, Matt, please vamp for me while I'm doing that. <laughs> See, and what's funny is I, I, for some reason, before we, before I figured out what it really meant, I thought it meant, like, um, beatboxing, basically. So I thought vamping was like, mm -ch, mm -ch, mm -ch. so... Well, Think that's yeah. true. I'm gonna go ahead and vamp. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. <laughs> Hope everyone enjoys my Daily Planet, y'all. Yeah, the, I mean that's that the word origin is from music, but it's taken on a new meaning, guys. Matt, did you see people were mad at our pronunciation of Marquis again? Oh, people were mad at our pronunciation of Marquis. Yeah, that's odd. Yeah. Guys, the thing that people don't understand is when they tell us we're pronouncing things wrong, it just ensures that we will never pronounce it right. Yeah, and also, we're going by the audiobook guide, and also, also, if we pronounced it Marquis, people would be telling us it's pronounced Marquis, and they can't stand <laughs> hearing it pronounced Marquis, so... That's true. That's definitely true. <laughs> it's Marquis, guys. It's definitely Marquis. I don't I don't think I mentioned I don't think we mentioned this on the on the podcast, but apparently Marquis can fly. Yeah. Well we had we had a discussion about that right before we started. Because I was you, like I was like, I'm pretty sure that's Marquis it's flying. Yeah. And you were like, No, that's that's Batman. <laughs> I was like it never occurred to me that that could be Marquis, but maybe. Yeah, he's going after Panacea. Yeah. This is awesome. It's really beautiful. Yeah. Marquise? <laughs> That's not right. 
I mean, I'm I, if it were Maquis or something, like, and I know Maquis is pronounced Maquis, but you put an R in there and all bets are off. I mean, the French word, it's pronounced Marquis. Like, that's that's the way I have pronounced the word that way in my entire life. But when the audiobook tells me to pronounce it a certain way, that's what I'm going to do. Yeah, yeah. And when people tell me I'm wrong, then I'm going to double down. <laughs> yeah. That's that's really the main thing that we want to emphasize is all those every time when we end the podcast and tell us that we want your your feedback and criticism. <laughs> that's <We're> a, lying. <laughs> that's a lie. <laughs> that's not true. We want feedback and criticism, just not to the matter of you pronounced this wrong yeah. again. Yeah. Marquis learned to fly when Kepri controlled him and spent one tenth of a second learning how to use his power. <laughs> <That's funny. laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thanks, Kevin. When people tell me I'm wrong, I'm gonna double down the story of Scott's life. That's true, and look where it's gotten me. I'm on a stream with a giant picture of Matt's head. <laughs> you think I'm kidding? Like you're the stream right now. <laughs> that's that's wonderful. Really hope that picture looks good at a higher resolution. It looks great, Matt. It looks okay. great. I mean, as good as it can look, right? I'm gonna take. It's actually getting kind of creepy. So I'm <laughs> yeah, I figured. <laughs> Took a lot of takes to get the least creepy face that I, I could make. So, you, I mean, it, it's weird because one of your eyes like looks cybernetic. Kind of. <laughs> well, I don't think I have a cybernetic eye, but when's the last time you checked? Well, this morning. I can't believe there was a tie. I didn't want to tell anyone about the tie because I wanted there to be a tie. So I, did, I, I didn't. Like, uh, I could have yeah. like posted that there was a tie, but I didn't. See, I I looked I looked a little bit earlier and I saw they were really close, but uh, I wonder if it's still a tie. Did somebody suddenly vote while we were doing the podcast? Uh, it's it stopped at nine fifteen. So okay, I I made sure before I announced things. I see. Good 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 yeah. man good man. I'm pretty excited about this book. Although I hear none of the characters have names. I hear okay. it's just the biologist, the like it's just it's just a team of four women who are all uh named after their profession. That's what I hear. Okay. Just it's just gonna be fun to talk about, Matt. Yeah, I, I like this kind of story. It reminds me of Blindside immediately, where it's like team of science professionals go on alien mission thing. I mean, it, I guess it's kind of a tropey science fiction thing, actually, but I, I like that. I like that. Is look at, okay, how many, you can't see this map, but this is all of the quotes. I'm holding up my book with all the bookmarks where the quotes were. Nope, sure can't see it. I support Scott reading Pact and then being the Matt for Matt. Guys, we just finished a very long project. <laughs> we're not even done yeah. with it yet. Yeah, just got done giving birth to this baby. I'm not thinking about having sex right now. Whoa, you took it, took it somewhere. <laughs> um, I am not. Yeah, like we like we've said, packed is sh like it's short relatively. It's short for wild bow, which is a new definition of the word short. Yeah, How many it, words it, is it? It's like seven hundred thousand or something. Yeah, it's only. It's only half as long as the Wheel of Time. <laughs> it's barely 800,000 words. Oh, my God. That's a lot. Well, guys, I mean, maybe one day down the road, we'll have a Patreon goal for that. But the next thing we kind of want to do in a long-term format like this that's not Wildbow related is... The Dark Tower, where I will be the Matt, because I've read that series before. Yeah. In its, in its defense, a lot of the words are short. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god. Oh, this is ridiculous. But I'm actually rereading Stephen King. Um, in preparation for 
possibly having a Dark Tower podcast so I can be an expert. Cool. And, and by I'm rereading Stephen King, I mean I started Salem's Lot, the second book after Carrie, uh, half an hour before this podcast. <laughs> but it still counts. I read like five whole pages. Yeah. No, I think I think a Dark Tower cast would be fun. Um, I think it it would work with the format we have. Um, or I think it would work for the, in the We've Got Worm format. Yeah, it's just a matter of finding an audience for it because we found you guys, but I don't know if there's a Dark Tower community. I mean, there is. A lot of people have read Dark Tower. It's just getting them to acknowledge that we exist. Right. This is way more fun if there's interaction and not just silence. Kevin, you don't have to ring, read all of King's books for Dark Tower. No, there's... Um, there's characters and references to stuff in throughout uh, King's work, but the story works on its own. Um, there, like the one of the really one of the big characters in uh, a couple of his like some books are. I'm trying to remember which books are more important to read. I think Salem's Lot is fairly important, but like not in a way that. You don't have to. You don't have to read any Stephen King to read Dark Tower. It will. It does not take away anything not having read Stephen King. It only adds if you've read Stephen King. So like, if if I want to do a cast on it, where I am the expert and Matt is the new person, I want to have read all the books recently so I can point out the spots in which this is a reference to X. This is what he's doing that's tying back to Y. Um, yeah, you're absolutely right. And Salem's Lot is one. The Stand is very important. Um, and Insomnia, those are all... Yeah, yeah. The Stand is a great book, too. So, I have a friend that has never read a word of Stephen King outside of Dark Tower, and he read the whole series and really liked it. So, And that's kind of what you're, you'd be doing, right, Matt? Because yeah. you've only read Carrie and uh, Needful Things, I think. Um, that... Uh, is correct. I, I think I read. Um, I read on writing actually. Um, that trying to th- count. Trying to think if I read like I feel. I just feel like I read like another short story or something at some point. But it's it's I'm like sure, yeah. It's like yeah. something that I have no like evidence for being true. So I I don't know. Because yeah. um, I'm I I used to read um, a lot of short story anthologies like, uh, which actually. I, I miss doing it's it was really f- my mom would always buy me like a giant short story anthology every christmas mm-hmm. and uh and i would and i would read it and it's such a good way of, of digesting like a broad sampling of you know the 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 science fiction du jour um um yeah no you're right i i my, one of my big goals for next year is to read more, just in general, um, outside of outside of this. So we've got, we're going to read at least 12 books next year, Matt. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I, I'm excited I want, about that. I want to read more for fun, too. Like, I, I have so many, like, my, you can't see the shelf behind me, everyone, because it's too far away. But that's basically every single book I want to read is on that shelf. Oh, it's late. I get to see Star Wars tomorrow. When are you watching Star Wars? Um, not tomorrow, actually. I I, I was mistaken about my schedule, but um, um, I'm not sure. I'm not. Uh, I mean, I want to see it. I want to try to see it Sunday, but I, I haven't actually bought tickets. So you should uh, probably go ahead and do that. Yeah, that's something that is probably a true fact. If you want to be on the award-winning Daily Planet podcast Star Wars episode. Oh wait, are you doing that Sunday night? Yeah. Oh. Then yeah. That's when we always do it, Matt. I know. I don't know. Uh, Michael's in town, so he might be over here. I don't. At least I think he is. I don't know. He just kind of shows up and never. <laughs> Your brother randomly asked me for my address today. I don't know huh. what that means. Huh. No, Kevin. Elise is not being on the Star Wars podcast. <laughs> no. <laughs> she 
she every time like <laughs> every time she sees someone say anything about her on the podcast she's like really they, they said that about they like me they like me. and then like i've showed i've showed her kevin's comments and she recognizes his name now so she did, i showed her it again today and she's like well that's just the same guy <laughs> it doesn't count it's really funny star crash star crash i'm going to google it It's like Star Wars, but better. I don't believe you. Yeah, this looks terrible. It has David Hasselhoff in it. Uh, Star Crash, you say? Mm Mm-hmm. I I can't even Google what that is right now, so... Yeah, you can't Google anything. No. All right, I'm going to go read and then go to bed and then go watch Star Wars. All right. Have a good sequence of events, everyone, yeah. including Scott. <laughs> thanks. Yeah, guys, thanks for joining. It was fun. Um, if you have friends that like to participate in this stuff that can do live streams, tell them. Because, I mean, the the voting in the books is restricted to patrons, but the stream itself is open to everyone so literally anyone can join anyone can participate anyone can can hang out so we want more people in here it's fun when a lot of people are talking you guys the three of you were excellent this time um it was great but yeah yeah you, yeah you guys really did add to add to the discussion it, i think it was it was great yeah I thank completely you completely agree yeah all right guys we'll talk soon i'm sure bye bye <laughs>